Over the past 20 years, gaming franchises often dream of being an inspiration for all titles which follow it. Paving the path forward in either storytelling, gameplay, or design is a feat accomplished by few. But not all are required to go down in history. When a masterful design in the action genre is capable of catapulting you to great heights, it can allow the other aspects to be a bit silly. But behind all of the quirky antics, out there personalities, and over-the-top action can be a meaningful story that'll make even devils cry. Wow, nice. Okay, let's get started. This is a bit long. Devil May Cry wasn't always the game we know today. In fact, replace the demons with zombies and the title of the franchise to Resident Evil, and you get what the game almost was. Hideki Kamiya might be more popularly associated with high-octane action games like Devil May Cry and Bayonetta, but he was originally a oh, horror genre. He directed Resident Evil 2, and that game went on to be a massive success despite his lack of interest in the horror genre. With the success of that game, he was later sought after to create another entry in the Resident Evil series, specifically for its fourth installment. But this time around, he would be given complete creative control to do what he wanted. The result was a more stylized action game. The main character, Tony Redgrave, was an invincible man with skills and intellect beyond that of a normal person. They tried really hard to make their main character and everything around him cool. But while it was a neat idea, everything began straying too far from what people came to expect from a Resident Evil title. The original gameplay and horror elements were hardly there anymore. So instead, the this game is also a game that I am probably gonna play in the future. And thus, Devil May Cry was born. The game was developed by Team Little Devils, a group of staff members within Capcom who designed everything from the ground up. The main character's name was changed to Dante, and the world was no oh. longer infested with zombies, but demons. Since the franchise has ah, gone on to produce course, five games, demons. multiple light novels, manga, animated series, and other supplemental material, the timeline for some has become confusing due to the order and fluctuating canon these stories have gone in and out of. So mm. I thought it was time I give you the complete, unabridged timeline of Devil May Cry. Let's rock, baby. Let's rock. That's like a cool uh, this story title. Begins at creation. Darkness was the first existing entity, and from it spawned the demon world, a hellish realm which was home to nightmarish creatures. Demons are simply born in this world, and as such, it is where their true strength is held. Mm. Here, demons can unleash their full might and potential, vying for power. It is in a demon's natural instinct to obtain power and influence, no matter the cost. As such, they are very selfish and cruel, never showing remorse or pity to anyone or anything it needs to step on to get there. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm probably not going to interact with chat for a while, so yeah. Uh, for Devil May Cry, there's Devil May Smile. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, let's continue. With such darkness plaguing the world, it was inevitable that light was born as well. In other words, the human world. Humans serve as the light to the demons' as darkness. Unlike mm, the demons, that makes humans sense. are exceptionally weak physically speaking, however come with a vast array of emotions, feelings, and heart that the demons lack. Since the human world was born from the darkness of the demon world, it meant that the two worlds were originally one. This wrought havoc on the humans okay, I see. a not quite specified event. A demonic god wielding a giant spear separated the two worlds, giving independence to both the human and demon world. Mm. With it came an era of peace and prosperity for the humans, allowing peace. them to thrive without the threat of being mm -hmm. murdered. Of sure. course, there were their fair share of detractors. Some humans sided with the demons and worshipped them, and so they created Hellgates, a portal which could be used to travel between both worlds. They are not the only method of one side traveling to the other, but there are plenty of man-made portals, both large and small, that were created. What's up, Meanwhile, Ryu? in the demon world, plays were being made for power. Despite the chaos that is hell, there is always one ruler who is the most powerful demon of all, and someone was looking to dethrone him. 
The earliest and most current ruler in this timeline is unnamed, but the one looking to challenge him was Mundus, also known as the Prince of Darkness. This is so he deep. Is what many consider the epitome of evil. He possesses a real god complex, figuratively and literally. He dons the image of a muscular, elderly, bearded man, very reminiscent to the likes of Zeus or other Christian gods. But if he wanted to take control of the demon world, he needed power beyond his wildest dreams. Power which was unrivaled. Fortunately for him, he heard tell of the Clyphot fruit. It's a demonic tree grown in the underworld that when sufficiently nourished, grows a fruit that imbues that which ate it with divine power. It's such a rarity that it can only grow once every few thousand years. To nourish it, however, it requires I human blood. Would not. The state in which it grows is fairly unique, as it is the inverse to that of a normal tree. That is tree. a the shot. The roots are what break yes. their way to the surface, spreading and sucking the life Ew. out of any human it can find. The Clyphot is so powerful that it can even fuse the human uh, and human world back into one. This fruit was perfect for me, and so he nourished his own Clyphot and ate. It's just mild, but one of the most powerful divine demons yep, I hated in the that. underworld. With its power, he slayed the previous demon king and became the emperor of Mundus the Among Us. <laughs> With Mundus as its ruler, his reign was not without its challenges, nice. however, as another powerful demon named Argusax challenged Argus his rule. Even despite having eaten the Clyphot fruit, Mundus could not outright defeat Argusax so easily. He's considered the most wicked deity by its followers. A great war was waged in the underworld, with neither one truly coming out as the victor. As such, the demon world was effectively split into two, half ruled mm, by Mundus and the I other see. by Argusax. Regardless, this didn't seem to phase Mundus, as he had other plans to continue his rule. Figuring that since the human and demon world were once one in the past, one piece it should yeah. be that way again, but Kinda. with him ruling both. He planned on leading an army of demons to conquer the world, however faced one completely unexpected form of resistance. His right-hand man and the greatest swordsman the demon world had ever seen, Sparta, objected to his conquest. Unlike the majority of demons, Sparta exhibited many traits much more associated with humans. He understood honor and possessed great wisdom, which he tried to pass down to his mm. two apprentices. Yeah, there's, there's always that character, but most you know? Importantly, he had a heart, a righteous one at that, and seeing the tyranny and injustice Mundus was planning, he chose to stand against not only him, but the entire demon realm. Wow, this he guy's a chad. No malice towards them or his own kind, but he used his blade to defend the weak. Sparta's rebellion was infamous as he stood on the side of yeah, That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> and sliced his way through hordes of Mundus's minions until he stood face to face with him in his own chamber. Mm. The two would have an arduous duel against one another, each exchanging blows and battle damage. While Mundus almost gets the upper hand, Sparta's tenacity to never give up and continue fighting even at the cost of his own life pushes him to overthrow the giant and seal him in a Wow, fight. he actually won. Sparta what a giga chad. Victorious and pushed back all those who stood on Mundus' side back into the demon realm. As such, humanity worshipped the kindness he showed, the morale of his character okay. to defend the helpless even when they had nothing to offer him. He instantaneously became a legend. As he His should. The obviously didn't sit well with those in the demon world. As such, to ensure the safety of humanity, he chose to stay in their world and worked diligently to ensure demons could no longer attempt something like that again. It was but... not easy, as the gateway between worlds was enabled thanks to a structure called the Temen Negru. As it serves as the true portal to the demon world, it would also serve as the <laughs> lock he would use to keep it the hell are you? Sparta implemented <laughs> many failsafes to its structure. He stripped the names of seven yeah. powerful demons, each represent- I was gonna say, what if... Doesn't their... Isn't their power coming from, uh... The demon world, so... Isn't he basically just a sitting sitting duck on the human world? The seven vices, Maybe. Staking them to the ground Let's see. as seals. Various gatekeepers were left behind within the tower to protect it, but most importantly of all, he poured all of his demonic energy into his sword, robbing him of the majority of his abilities. 
In doing so, it closed the door between realms. He used his blood and the blood of a human priestess to close the gateway, and a mystical oh. amulet, also known as the perfect amulet, was crafted and serves as the key to this whole seal. With that, the true gateway was closed. No longer with his signature sword, he had crafted two others to represent the other aspects of him. The Sparta holds and thus represents his raw power. The Rebellion embodies his retaliation against the demon world, and the Yamato, a god of death. To him, these three traits embody who he is, and as such, the weapons would be very meaningful to him as well as powerful. His journey did not end there. While the Temen Negru might be the true gateway, there were still plenty of other portals demons could use to get to the human realm. Hellgates were another method, but there was only really one that is considered a true Hellgate. It was located in a city called Fortuna, and so Sparta made his way there to seal it. He used the Yamato to lock the gate so no demons could come through, however this one was more of just a key. If someone got their hands on the Yamato, they too could reopen the gate just as easily as he locked it. For a short period of That's... time, he benevolently ruled over Fortuna as its feudal lord. While many worshipped him as a god here, life pulled him in many directions. He was summoned by protectors That's a fatal flaw, called Vidar in my opinion. <laughs> for his help. A small group of devil worshippers on the island began worshipping Argasax and eventually summoned him to the human world. The protectors attempted to banish him, but couldn't, and so called upon the help of Sparta, who, even despite his lack of powers, still worked with the protectors and successfully sealed him away with four relics. He lived on the mm, human world see. for 2,000 years, and while everyone knew the name of Sparta then, as time passed, his story slipped into legend. He became a figure that people thought was just There's an anime for this? People even knew it to begin with. He faded out huh. of the public eye, and less and less people were aware of the name Sparta. It was the natural evolution of time, not yeah. that he actually cared about the notoriety. But probably the most important venture he took as a human was that of love. He met a beautiful woman with blonde hair, dark eyes, and a fair complexion. While unknown how she snagged the heart of the Dark Knight, she fell in love with him and possessed her own special fire. He probably had her name a child. Was Eva. While we are not witness to much of their time together, we know she was important enough to him that they got married. Mm, there we go. The boys' names were Dante and Virgil. Mm. Due to the nature of their parents, the two were half demon, half human. I see. They were still able to utilize demonic power, but didn't come with the completely selfish nature most demons are born with. Sparta had also gifted Eva the amulet he used to seal the demon world sometime when they first met. While forever preventing So he didn't die since he's, he is a demon, he's immortal? Hmm. I still don't know yet. Demons but yeah. ever making their way to the human world was a nigh <laughs> impossible task. He certainly made it difficult for them to try. The job was executed as well as he could have, and so decided to try his hand at simply living. With the demon world sealed off and nothing more to seemingly worry about, Sparta was allowed to live life like a human and with his family. They lived in a remote home in Redgrave City, tucked away from many neighbors. As they were growing up, Sparta trained Dante and Virgil how to wield a sword and even pass down the weapons he forged. The rebellion was entrusted to Dante, while the Yamato to Virgil. Unfortunately, living Wait, life what? with his family- Sorry. The rebellion was entrusted to Dante while the Yamato to Virgil. Oh, so this is Virgil. Ah, I see. Okay, that makes sense Yamato now. To Virgil. Unfortunately, living life with his family wouldn't last too long as during some unknown event, Sparta disappeared. It's been stated by many that he died, but why, where, and how is all unknown. All that is important is that from this point moving forward, Sparta is gone. Eva was then left Why did he leave though? Boys all by herself. Fortunately by the sounds of it for plot despite being for plot demons, raising them was just like raising a child. Stressful. 
As practice, Dante and Virgil would frequently fight with each other, sparring with their training swords as well as fighting over the most mundane of things. But they did have their fair share of brotherly bonding, That's really particularly cute. in their use of the catchphrase jackpot. As a memoriam and keepsake to <laughs> remember their father, Eva split the perfect amulet that he gifted her yeah, into this two is the game. Halves, giving each one to both Dante and Virgil on their eighth birthday. Virgil, Dante, happy birthday. Personality-wise, Dante himself is a bit of an outgoing, extroverted kid who enjoys getting rough and fighting, while Virgil was kind of the opposite. Mm -hmm. He was much more reserved. While yeah, that's kind of what I brother, imagine. Virgil had a keen interest in literature, particularly for poetry and the works of William Blake. The man who Virgil went to who collected these books gifted a collection to he him. He for the milk. <laughs> fond and passionate about the work. To mark the book for himself so Dante wouldn't God. steal it, Virgil wrote the letter V on the cover to signify that it was his. This book would be very important to him as he would continue carrying it into and throughout his adult life. Unfortunately, the worst possible fate befell their family. Due to his rebellion, Sparta made many enemies seeking revenge for oh, what he did. It's but that story, the most huh? dangerous enemy he made and didn't choose to kill was Mundus. He was infuriated with his defeat at the hands of his once trusted comrade, and so took the most evil route he could with Sparta no longer around. He went after his family. On one unsuspecting evening, a demon attack was launched on their family home. Dante and Eva were inside, and doing what only a mother would do, she attempted to protect her children. She hid Dante in a closet and left him with one final message in case she didn't return. I need to find Virgil. I promise I'll be back. I know this is hard. You must listen to me. Be a big boy. A man. Huh? If I don't return, you must run. By yourself. Alone. You must change your name. Forget your past and start a new life. As someone else. A new beginning. That's depressing. And with that, she ran off in a desperate attempt to find Virgil. Unfortunately for everyone involved, she could not find him in time and was. Oh, was there a bot? Oh, thank God. Thanks for you. I didn't even notice. Thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Damn, there's a lot of those uh those bots nowadays. Jeez. All right, let's continue. Let's rewind a bit. And with that, she ran off in a desperate attempt to find Virgil. Unfortunately for everyone involved, she could not find him in time and was killed by demons inside as their house burnt to a crisp. Yeah, as I expected. Where Virgil was was on their playground just outside their house where he was ambushed by demons as well. He was impaled, stabbed, and skewered by their blades and left to die. But fortunately, thanks to his demon blood, he survived the onslaught. It didn't okay. change that he was scared and wanted help, most desperately from his mother, to come and save him. But she never did. So he was forced to act himself. It is here his inner demon awakens, and he summons the Yamato by complete accident, laying waste to every demon in sight. Oh. As his house burnt to ash, the poor child was left believing that his mother abandoned him. This gave him the belief that he could only rely on himself for protection. If he never wanted to get hurt again, and to be able to protect those he cared about, the only way he figured he could do that was with power. Power, yeah. That's kind of what I got. Uh, it's kind of my impression for an, uh, Virgil, because I know he's very powerful. From this point moving forward, we would largely follow the story of Dante. After the incident at his home, he not only believed that his mother was killed, but his brother as well, as he was nowhere to be found in the aftermath. As such, he heeded his mother's last words. Man and Lock mean his MC name. power? He yeah. <laughs> to name himself after the city he grew up in, going under the new name Tony Redgrave. 
For the That's a cool name. What the hell? Confused, I will continue referring to Dante as Dante. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aware that he is going under the alias of Tony Redgrave. Yeah, Despite okay. This, he did not seek a new or normal life, instead dedicating himself to avenging his mother by killing demons. He used the alias not as a complete shield to prevent demons from finding him altogether, but as a way so he could hone his practice and swordsmanship when he was first coming up. He of course wielded his father's gift to him, the Rebellion, as his primary weapon. Mm, One of the earliest okay. places we are aware that Dante lived when he was a child was called Morris Island. Not much information exists from his time here, other than he made friends with another kid named Ernest. By the sounds of it, they were really great childhood friends, even burying their own treasure box and promising to never tell anyone where it was. The curious thing about Dante's childhood here is the people's recollection of his mother. Evo was most certainly dead as he was going by Tony, and it's never been mentioned about Dante having another woman take care of him. It could be that he lied about her and he lived alone, but by the way the people speak, it sounds like they actually saw and interacted with her. Regardless of this minute detail, tragedy would yet again follow him. A powerful demon, which God we damn. presume was in search of him and sensed his powerful bloodline, attacked the town setting everything ablaze. Nearly everyone was killed, and those who survived blamed Dante and his mother. Yeah. As such, they left the town in search of new horizons. If Dante's mother from Morris Island was real, then she died shortly after as Dante became independent and grew into his teen years. He's a teenager? What the fuck? As the years passed by okay. and Dante became more capable, he found yeah, I mean, that makes profession sense. profession to continue hunting demons and make some money in the process, being a mercenary. It was a profession that those who had largely congregated at Bobby's Cellar. It's a dive bar where mercenaries and information brokers do business. Dante didn't take just any job as he had certain philosophies he'd try and stick to. Considering no one knew about demons, the jobs that he did take he first had to be interested in. But they would also be the ones that sounded unusual. If he had a hunch about how weird it sounded, he would likely <laughs> accept the job as chances were it yeah. might have involved demons. <laughs> Despite being it's a young funny. teenager at the time, he built up his own reputation, making many new acquaintances along the way. One of the most important was an information broker named Enzo Farino, a short-statured Italian-American. He's one of the best, most reliable information brokers in the city and has built up a prestigious reputation amongst mercenaries. His job is to act as the middleman and find jobs that need that, doing, God damn. the best mercenary that fits the client's needs. Look at Dante this. was easily the best mercenary around and Look at so his naked body. <laughs> that Enzo would seek him out as a partner and I'm so sorry. they became. Dante was offered many jobs by Enzo, oh, man. as stated, would only pick the ones that seemed unusual or interested him much to the chagrin of Enzo, <laughs> though he wasn't aware of the existence of demons. Dante uh. also gained a partner on the field who took on many jobs with him named Gru. He's Gru? A of three daughters and is what the hell? To still be in the profession. Gru? From, you know, from Minions? Named Gru. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's a father of three daughters and is slightly too old to still be in the profession of mercenary, but like most... God damn, where are the minions? But probably the most important and impactful person Dante would meet here was Nell Goldstein, the local gunsmith. Dante visited here frequently, as despite his sword being able to withstand any battle damage incurred, any guns he used were unable to keep up with his trigger finger and always wound up broken. The relation mm. between the two grew over time. Nothing romantic, but more of a familial relation. Nell would treat Dante like her own child, which she had and he reminded her of, and berate him yeah. at just about every opportunity. And likewise, Dante began seeing Nell as a mother figure. But everything changed mother when figure. a new mercenary came ah. to town, Gilver, a mysterious bandaged man sporting a green suit and wielding a slim katana looking to join a group of popular mercenaries. Upon his arrival, he chooses to pick a fight with the strongest one around, which of course happened to be Dante. Of course. To everyone's surprise, the two go toe to toe and he proves himself so physically capable that a winner is undetermined. This quickly put Gilver on a high demand hiring list. Unlike Dante, Gilver took on any job that came his way and thanks to his incredibly calm attitude and generous personality, he won over the favor of pretty much the entire mercenary guild. 
but as you likely could expect, Gilver was not actually a friendly ally. Rather, he was a yeah. demon under the service of Mundus. With the trust he had gained, he slowly lured in okay. and had the other mercenaries killed and turned into God. demons. His oh. plan was to slowly allow the darkness to distort and manifest all of the human world. He went to many great lengths to Damn. hide his identity, even killing an innocent man who was simply looking into who he actually was. His presence did make few suspicious, such as Nell herself. She was aware of the victim who was looking into Gilver's identity turning up dead, but she also saw something with her own eyes. When Gilver visited her shop, kind of looks like my mom. You ground, mean Gilver? Not Mirror, the man he appeared. Are you at, sure? But rather, an armored knight of sorts. This made her wary, and she disclosed these worries to Dante. But one of the most important kills came from the likes of Gru. Desperate for money to support his daughters, he took on an assassination request, and his target was Gilver. Unfortunately for him, I can't the take job him seriously was now. As expected, Gilver was much too experienced and skilled, and thus Gru was killed instead. His eldest daughter Jessica also fell ill, and thanks to the demonic influence seeping out from the underworld, she began hallucinating about demons. She was pulled into the demon world and fused with a demonic tree that began using her pain and despair to grow a path to the human world. Dante mm. caught wind of Jessica's hallucinations and quickly rushed over to the sanatorium she was held at, only to find it had transformed into a portal. He traversed his way through where he inevitably found Jessica. Unfortunately, there was nothing Dante could do to save her. No human could he looks like a mummy. the demon world twisted her into, and she already showed very little signs of response. Nice. So he did the only <laughs> thing he could and put her out of her misery. The deaths of both Wait, Gru let's and go Jessica, back a little bit. I'm there was sorry. nothing Dante could do to save her. Only to find it had transformed into a portal. He traversed his way through where he inevitably found Jessica. Unfortunately, there was nothing Dante could do to save her. No human could survive what the demon world twisted her into, and she already showed very little signs of response. So he did the only thing he could and put her out of her misery. God damn. The deaths of both Gru and Jessica would remain a mystery to the townsfolk. Only speculation and rumors began spreading, with of course the blame being shifted onto Dante. Of course. With all of these events boiling together, it was getting closer and closer to the final confrontation. But the catalyst that really set the events in motion was when Nell's shop was targeted. She had been spending pretty much all of her time in this story tinkering on some unknown project, and when a surprise explosion engulfs her shop, Dante immediately rushes in to investigate, only to find her still calmly working. Despite his warnings about the fire, she ignores everything, instead choosing to showcase her masterpiece. She had crafted two pistols specially designed to withstand Dante's trigger finger. Wow. They were unlike any other weapon she had crafted before, and the best thing she would ever invent. To make them truly his, she had him assemble the final parts. The pistols were named Ebony and Ivory. An inscription lay etched on the That's side a cool of the name. Barrel, marking for Tony Redgrave by 45 Art Warks, a misspelling she purposefully made in honor of her son. With her masterpiece completed, she fell to the ground, revealing she had a large gash sliced across her back. Yet again, helpless to do anything, all Dante could do was sit there with her in her final moments. The image of Dante reminded her of her own child, Rock, as she struggled to speak to him before she eventually passed away in his arms. The death of Nell struck a particularly sore chord with Dante. Despite how close the two were and how important That's they really were sad. to one another, it made him realize that he lied to her. She only ever knew Tony Redgrave. She never had the full truth of who he was uh -huh. or what he did. And so dying without even knowing his real name, he hated it. And to lose yet another mother figure to the likes of demons, it reminded him of his past. By changing his name, the result stayed the same. Nothing was actually changing except the people he was close to were pushed away by a lie. The change that he wanted was killing demons, and he didn't need an alias to do that. So, so instead, sad. he chose to abandon Tony Redgrave completely. He embraced the name of Dante, choosing to move forward as himself, reigning hell amongst all demons and using Nell's pistols to do so. The story would, of course, lead to a confrontation between Dante and mm -hmm. Gilver, with the two exchanging blows. Yeah. The real twist of the story comes when Dante shoots the bandages off of his face, revealing it 
to be Virgil. <gasps> this would not be the actual Virgil, however. In oh. reality, it was a demon created by Mundus in the likeness of him. Oh. These were known as Angelos. I was going to say. An experiment by Mundus to copy Sparta and his son's abilities. He tried using data from a poser. in Virgil's fight. <laughs> However, unfortunately, nothing could quite replicate the real thing. Gilver is defeated and would fade away with all of the other demonic power that tried to consume the human world. After everything, Dante was left feeling quite remorseful and empathetic to all that was lost here, especially to the likes of his old partner, Gru. Not only did he die, but Dante was personally responsible for killing his eldest daughter. Because of his guilt, he opens up a bank account for his remaining two daughters as a way to say sorry. He would frequently send what little money he had to them for the foreseeable future. And with that, he left town for New Horizons. Ah. Good verse, sus. <laughs> God damn it. With yet another chapter of Dante's life behind him, we enter a more modern era of history. Dante, now currently around the age of 18. While he leaves behind much that he had in the novel, one thing he did take with him was Enzo. Being one of his most profitable agents, he likely decided to follow him into town when he moved. In fact, it was him who helped him secure an office space for his freelancing business, which Dante hadn't named yet. Enzo himself rented out a room at the Love Planet Strip Club right next door. For the most part, their dynamic of business would remain the same. Enzo would provide jobs, and Dante would only take the ones that interested him. This guy. This I love this guy already. History also Enzo. Saw the reintroduction of Virgil. The last time we saw him, he was a kid set off to attain more power, and since then, he has, however, not nearly as much as he would have liked. During his ventures, he traveled to the city of Fortuna, oh, that's Virgil. once ruled, to investigate the organization known as the Order of the Sword. They're a militant religion which worships Sparta with the objective to eradicate all demons. Virgil was curious to learn what their true objective was and to learn more about his father, so he investigated himself. What he discovered was their desire for power. He leaves uncertain whether or not he can call them misguided, but is adamant that true power lies in the blood of Sparta. Well, I can't exactly call them misguided. Oh, that voice though. God damn. But soon they shall know this devil's power. That's a sexy man. A power greater than they ever imagined. The power of a son of Sparta. The City of Fortuna and the Order of the Sword will be greatly expanded and explained upon further down the timeline. What is surprisingly oh, let's go. most out of character Holy for shit. Virgil it's so was cool. a personal detour he took whilst in the city. In an unexpected twist, he I'm slept trying not to with scream a woman there and late. unknowingly got her pregnant. Who this woman is slept with a woman to her he took whilst in the city. In an unexpected twist, he slept with a woman there and unknowingly got her pregnant. Who this woman is remains a mystery. Unknowingly? The fuck do you mean? <laughs> what? History. As far as fan speculation goes, many presume it is the woman in red seen drawing her eye towards him when he first arrives. Regardless, a woman would be pregnant and there would be yet another blood of Sparta to be born. Okay, I guess it's a, he's a playboy. He's just... There is also an entirely new set of characters that need to be introduced for this chapter, and that would be the family of a man named Arkham. He was married to... <sighs> yeah, a what the fuck? I know, right? Man, and they gave birth to a daughter whom he named Mary. By unexplained or perhaps pure coincidence, Mary had inherited the blood of the legendary priestess Sparta had slain to seal the Temen Negru the true portal to the demon world. Arkham himself was a scholar who studied in the black arts and became obsessed with the legend of Sparta. He wanted to attain the same level of power as he had and rule the world as its god. In his pursuit of power, he <laughs> sacrificed his wife Kalina in a oh ritual for demonic influence. However, it resulted in failure. He suffered a severe burn scar on the side of his head, I and see. the demonic power he did gain certainly wasn't what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. He obtained multiple alter egos. Ah, his most what? popular one was Jester. As such, he did inherit a multitude of different dark magic abilities, but none that were capable of being hailed as godlike. 
He could switch between both personalities at will, and it was nigh impossible to assume that they were the same person due to the drastic difference in demeanor they both had, but mm, that's a very niche I situation. See. The sacrifice of her mother obviously didn't sit well with Mary. She disowned her father and renounced her name, and chose to walk down the path of a devil hunter, as she had become well versed in their existence thanks to her father. With the passage of time, Arkham came to learn much about the Temen Negru and Sparta. He was practically an expert. Pretty much anything about everything relating to Sparta and how he sealed the demon world away, Arkham knows. Since Sparta sealed his demonic power inside his blade to use as a seal, he figured that if he could claim the sword, he could simply inherit Sparta's power left behind. The problem that lied in his way were all of the failsafes implemented by the Dark Knight, which made it nearly impossible for Is she single? to just break. Why don't you find Firstly, out? Firstly were the Seven Sin Demons who had their names stripped. To be released, their names had to be returned to them, but could only be done by someone related to Sparta. The gatekeepers stand as guards within the building. They need the blood of a descendant of a pure priestess whom he'd used to help seal the tower, which coincidentally just so happened to be his daughter, and the blood of Sparta Who just so happened. his blood huh. was also used. And on top of all of that, he made a key, the perfect amulet which he gave to Ava, which she had since split into two and given to Dante and Virgil. Arkham Ooh. was aware Thanks for the fan service. This. It's how dedicated he was to attaining power. Amongst his research, he would of course become aware of Dante and Virgil. So you'd imagine his surprise when Virgil wandered into his library searching for a book. Knowing exactly who he is, he takes the opportunity to regale him with the tale of his own father. The tale of the demon warrior Sparta. That's not what I'm looking for. Leave me. Then what are you looking for? A demon that impregnates a woman who then bears twin sons. That's the story, isn't it? <laughs> Leave me. I won't tell you a third time. Despite Virgil's initial dismissiveness, God damn. and lack of fear towards demonic teaching piques his interest. He discloses his plan to raise the Temen Negru and how it can be used to harness the true power of Sparta. Amongst the many things Arkham is aware of, Virgil's desire for power is one of them. What Virgil doesn't know is that Arkham wants the power for himself. While he doesn't fully sway Virgil into considering him an ally, since he is incapable of raising the Temen Negru by himself, the way himself, he holds he his sword oh. necessary to go at it alone, he is forced to ally himself with Arkham in an effort to shatter the seal to the demon world. As a prelude to the events of Devil May Cry 3, a two-volume okay. manga series was released to set the scene set one year before the events of the game. The whole plan to break the seal to the demon world was pretty much spearheaded by Arkham. <laughs> the problem he currently faced was in regards to Dante. While allying with Virgil, Virgil Never change, all of his Never problems, change. <laughs> both of the brothers were needed to break the seal, or more accurately, their amulets. Arkham's methods when it came to Dante were much more subtle with the intention focused primarily on scouting just how capable he was. There are a lot of one-off characters introduced here that aren't exactly specified their identity or allegiance. For example, we are introduced to the likes of the Mad Hatter, the White Rabbit, and Alice. All plays on the Alice in Wonderland story, but demons seemingly on the side of Arkham. Details within the story would indicate that the Mad Hatter is actually Arkham himself. Similar to how he can transform into Jester, the Mad Hatter is one of his personas as well. The White Rabbit is but a puppet being controlled, and Alice is most certainly a demon working for Arkham and his interests. Hearing about his demon hunting business, Arkham hired Dante for four million dollars to rescue a little girl. Four named million? Alice. The story was that she willingly ran away from home where she was lured in by a demon who was trying to steal her purity. Everything took place ah. in the old abandoned mansion. All right. Dante was forced to fight waves of demons, leaving a trail of corpses in his path. To make his hack and slash adventure short, the story concludes with him not rescuing Alice, as that was never truly the point of the job, and she had no Oh, Alice in Wonderland! The Mad Hatter is also the I one see. who drops the bombshell to Dante that nice. Virgil is still alive and in town. 
The reason he does so is devoid of logic and doesn't make much sense even in context. But after seeing what he's seen, Dante ignores these words, believing them to perhaps be nothing more than a psychological tactic. However, the difference this time is something in his gut says otherwise. The revelation that his brother might still be alive even after he takes his leave still shakes him, and they even brush shoulders while walking Yeah, exactly, are you. But when Dante looks back, Virgil is already gone. The second volume of the manga focuses slightly more on Virgil and the steps he and Arkham are taking to release the Tamen Negru. In this case, it is the renaming of the Seven Sin Demons. The two have been going Seven around sins. returning their names slowly but surely. Arkham even attempts to lure in Dante yet again and trick him into renaming one of the sins, however, he doesn't fall for it. In fact, it would be during this ruse that the reunion between brothers would happen. As this demon was on Virgil's path when he came to release it, Dante was already there. It's anything but a heartwarming reunion of brothers. While Dante starts off playful considering that he thought Virgil to have been dead all of this time, it is quickly made clear the opposing intentions they both hold. Dante tells him that he's become a demon hunter, and Virgil tells him about claiming his half of the amulet, before he decides to give it back, claiming that he can take it whenever he wants. From here, the two leave, taking their separate paths. Dante, Virgil, and Arkham weren't the only characters that is so in the sad. story, however, <laughs> as Arkham's daughter Mary is also in town. She serves a much more subdued and muted role. She's in the really cute, manga, though. But still has her own set path she's traveling down. It can largely be summed up as her being I really like her design. in search of her father. While she doesn't get actively involved with demons, she does get roped in with a small side story with Alice. As she was walking down the street, Mary saw know, a distraught right? <laughs> girl on the side of the road and decided to help. She proclaims that she's lost, but possesses a map to her supposed home. Mary assists her and guides her to what winds up being Dante's shop. The truth is Alice is in pursuit of his amulet, and Mary is along for the ride. Alice becomes demonic, which pushes Mary to take refuge in the bathroom as she's without her weapons, while she waits for Dante to return. Upon his arrival, he immediately sniffs her out, which causes her to run away. He doesn't give chase, as she doesn't seem like a threat. This causes Dante to lower his guard, and he places his amulet on his desk while he intends on taking a shower. Mm. But during this moment, Alice yet again appears and snatches the amulet, running away, to which Dante finally gives chase. This was the ah. event that pulled Dante into fighting the Seven Sin, where he was reunited with Virgil. Mary leaves the building unseen, and her story ends there. There was an unreleased third volume of the manga, which was intended to focus primarily on her, however was never released, so her story oh, takes an that's a bummer. End. All in all, it can be summed up with her demon hunting journey leading her to this city so she can kill her father and avenge her mother. In honor of her, the weapon she wields, a rocket launcher, was named after her as the Kalina Ann. One year would eventually pass from the end of the manga and the brothers clash to the beginning of the game. Virgil, off screen, would inevitably rename the Seven Sins and the events of the game would be set in motion. Devil May Cry 3 opens up with Arkham meeting Dante face to face for the first time in his actual body. Virgil has decided <laughs> to reach out to Dante since their last God clash, damn that shirtless model. For another challenge to try and stop him. Arkham also, these graphics are really old. Of a whole plethora of demons for Dante to slash his way through. But the true sign that Virgil's plan to release the demon world was <laughs> in motion was the re-emergence of the Tamen I love crew. that scene. This not only grabs the attention of Dante, but Arkham's daughter as well. Having been pursuing the town in search of him, the clear sign of dark arts meant this was unmistakably where she could find him and take her revenge. Both of the characters would ascend the tower simultaneously, with Dante facing much more of the safeguards put in place by his father. The gatekeepers Cerberus, Agni and Rudra, Nevin, Beowulf, and Gurion all stand as honorable adversaries, but are bested and go on to serve new uses as devil arms. Is, is to she? Make sure what? Dante made his way to the top. Beowulf what the and hell? Gurion all stand as honorable adversaries, but are best. What the hell is that? And go on to serve new uses as devil arms. To make sure. You know, what? I'm just not gonna to ask. To the top, 
Arkham helped serve as a guide under the guise of Jester. He only appears when he needs to feed Dante new information or nudge him in a certain direction. During his path up the tower, he also crossed paths with Mary. Their interactions are anything but friendly on her. Oh no, he's hot. Yeah, as being he's so very. Close to her father, all she can see. Yeah. Is <laughs> Virgil becomes aware of her presence, and Arkham is forced to disclose their relation, which puts an even more wary Virgil even more on edge with his supposed partner. To ew! Ease, ew! states how he'll get rid of her, resorting in Ugh. a father-daughter reunion. Considering he needs her blood to break the seal, he only tosses her off the building, believing in her capacity to survive. This way, he can feign the argument to Virgil that he tried killing her without being obvious that he needs her. This attempt at tricking him in some ways does and doesn't work. Virgil comes to the belief that he's still holding on to bits of his humanity which are unnecessary for their plans. Seeing him as not fully committed to their goals, Virgil stabs him. Of course, the truth of the situation and the relevance of her blood right. is unknown to Virgil. Amongst other things he's unaware of is Arkham's demonic is dead? power, which makes the wound he just suffered non-lethal. Oh. Virgil would advance into the tower, seeing no further use for him. Meanwhile, <laughs> on top of the tower, a Get clash direct. between brothers would ensue. While both adamant in their goals, Virgil is the one who gains the upper hand and impales his brother, intending to kill him. But you see, this entire time, Dante has been living with one hand tied behind his back. Certain demons can unlock what is known as a devil trigger. It's oh. a that can allow someone to harness and utilize enhanced demonic strength. I, I've been listening to this song. Oh, that's it's so good. Uh, it's a um, devil trigger from uh, Devil May Cry 5. It's so good. Oh my god. Virgil it just reminded me of that song. To harness and utilize enhanced demonic strength. Virgil unlocked his when he was a kid during the tragedy, and since then he's been honing its power. But Dante's just been going about things his own way. Mm -hmm. But ironically, he's always had the ability to unlock his devil trigger because of his sword. Mm -hmm. Sparta made the rebellion to be a physical manifestation of Dante's Sorry. power. <laughs> to activate it, it just needed his blood. But because he was unaware of that, his powers remained dormant this entire time. That was until Virgil plunged the rebellion through his chest. Instead of killing him, the sword finally was able to react to its purpose and unlock yep. Dante's devil trigger. While Virgil is initially surprised, he knows exactly the power Dante has just gained. High on the overwhelming force, Dante is initially in a zombie-like state. But with power That's to be so attained cool. and both halves of the amulet acquired, there were more pressing matters at hand for Virgil. After recovering from his Devil Trigger, Dante is reinvigorated with all sorts of new energy. And considering he's not dead, that means Virgil still needs to be stopped. So he simply continues on his path through the tower. As for the journey wow. of Dante and Mary, the two would cross paths several In more times. Free? What? Dante's the what one who that? initially caught her after her father threw her off the tower, and it's where she learns that he's a demon after shooting him in the head and he doesn't die. After taking down the Leviathan, the two encounter once more, and it's where Mary gets her new name. So, tell me, what's your name? I don't have a name. Okay, then what should I call you? It's a cool scene. While I have been calling her Mary this whole time, despite the fact that she renounced it long ago and didn't go by any name, I had to call her something. Oh, skin brand, I see. Of the timeline. She, from this point moving forward, would be more popularly known take revenge on Virgil, who's finalizing his plans as we currently speak. As intended, Virgil's God restoration damn, of the this guy. amulet, along with his blood, are not enough to raise the tower, which comes much to his confusion. Why isn't this working? Wait, it's, uh, it's loading? No, it's fine on my end. Okay, stream fine now. I mean, there's no drop frames as of now. It was way worse when I last streamed. That was a disaster. Good, stream good. Okay.
Yeah, I mean, yeah. Let's just continue. Okay, now, yeah. Is Thanks, guys. Something missing. Must more blood be shed. Dante also arrives, and so he figures Thanks. that by adding his blood, that might be what's in the Tamenda grew. With the tower now awakened, Arkham opens a path to the demon world where he claims his long-awaited prize, Sparta's sword. He uses the amulet to activate it and pull it from its stone. Upon grasping the blade, all of Sparta's demonic power begins flowing through him, and he even takes the form of the legendary Dark Knight. But considering he just made an enemy out of all three characters, everyone was biting at the opportunity to take him down. Lady finds it her responsibility since he's her father, but Dante finds it his responsibility considering his father technically created the whole mess in the first place mm. and she wouldn't be powerful enough to take him down anyway. Yeah. It is within this moment where she begins to understand him despite his demon heritage. She's caught a glimpse of a demon who's fighting for humanity and a human who's just as evil as a demon. She accepts Dante's character and what he's standing for and gives him her rocket launcher in exchange for I his really name. like the and motions with that, Dante makes his way to the demon world as well. Of, uh, After coming face to face with Arkham despite you know, the Devil May Cry 3 this game even though it's a uh... It's really old, who's just as evil as a demon. but she somehow it's Dante's so fluid. And what he's standing for, and gives him her rocket launcher in exchange for his name. And with that, Dante makes his way to the demon world as well. After coming face to face with Arkham, despite donning the appearance of his father, the overwhelming power causes him to transform into something much more reflective of the darkness inside his heart. While Dante initially faces him alone, partway through the battle, Virgil joins the fray, seeking the power that was stolen from him. Together, the two brothers team up and take down Finally. the creature. Thank God. They even get to once again use their childhood catchphrase together. Jackpot. That's Arkham so cool. Is cast back to the human world where he lands in front of his daughter. This time around, he doesn't hold back in expressing his desires for becoming a god. While he still attempts to manipulate Lady and asks that she help him, she refuses and kills the monster she's wanted to for so long. Despite what everything would indicate, Lady was heavily distraught by this moment. While she often spoke about how she only had one parent in the form of her mother, yeah. context clues would say otherwise. That is it understandable. That there was a point in history where she loved her father and vice versa. However, after he murdered his wife, Lady tried to drown out her emotions with anger. That's the badass. Yeah, hell yeah, it is. Over the loss of her family. With Arkham out of the picture, it left Sparta's sword up for the taking. Virgil ah, of course, they're power, fighting and again. Dante looks to keep it out of his hands. As they've done countless times before, to settle the matter, the two fight. Unfortunately for Virgil, this time he is bested at the hands of his brother. He is wounded so heavily that he is forced to leave Sparta's sword behind, instead choosing to keep his half of their mother's amulet leaving the true power within the sword yet again dormant. He actually won. The portal That's connecting both huge. Closing, Virgil chooses to descend into the demon world as it is where their father came from and he seeks to be just like him. Despite Dante's attempt to save him, Virgil slashes his hand preventing him so he won't get trapped there as well. Dante is forced to return to the human world, also distraught and saddened over the events that transpired, which comes much to the shock of even Lady. Are you crying? It's only the rain. The rain already stopped. Oh, what? Wait. Did this game come out before uh Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood or the first uh the first adaptation? Really? That's interesting. Stopped. You guys know that scene, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I see. Devils never cry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Maybe somewhere out there, even a devil may cry when he loses a loved one. Don't you think? Maybe. With everything seeming to have been settled, the two join forces. Dante was finally able to open and find a name for his shop, <laughs> The Devil May Cry. And the two oh, that's why he says the devil may cry. Demon hunting. I see.
Virgil's fate would unfortunately not be so uplifting. Having returned to the demon world, he encounters Mundus himself. Yeah, I would imagine that, what he did, yeah. And blinded by the idea of power flowing through his veins, he rushes into battle against him, figuring that if Sparta could defeat him, so could he. Unfortunately, he failed. Yeah, he no, was yeah. He too weakened from his battle with Dante that even posing a threat to Mundus was impossible. Virgil was defeated, and his sword, the Yamato, was shattered in the battle. As punishment, Mundus strung up his bloody and beaten body, torturing him, mocking him for being a half-breed while vowing to remove his human heart, will, and ego. Virgil, over the span of ten years, would get corrupted and tortured. It was a living nightmare he was forced to experience. It was not an easy task on the part of Mundus, I mind you. Virgil refused to give in and wrested control of his own will for a long time. It wasn't until Mundus returned his mother's amulet to him, which he stole, that it made him into one of his puppets. The sentimental part that existed within him managed to drop his guard, and thus Virgil was corrupted and was renamed Nello Angelo. Huh? It was around this time Dante would also make a very important business partner named J.D. Morrison. He does have okay. two separate character designs as it was later changed, but both would be the same man. He's not actually a new character, relatively speaking. As his story would go, he was one of the many brokers who frequented Bobby's cellar and worked mm. with Dante when okay. he was Tony Redgrave. While Enzo was the one Dante mostly went to, he did take jobs from Morrison from time to time as well. Once Dante left, changed his name, and opened Devil May Cry, Morrison later tracked him down, learned of his name change, and became a business partner. The dynamic between Morrison and Enzo would switch. Morrison would then become Dante's main broker, after he became accustomed to the whole existence of demons, while Enzo showed up with the occasional odd job. As stated, the events that span between Devil May Cry 3 and 1 are- Imagine 10 years. years. Dante goes from an 18-year-old amateur to a 29-year-old professional demon hunter. Imagine getting Sometime tortured for 10 period, years. He and Lady Jesus. Ways. She went off to do her own solo demon hunting, but kept in touch every now and then with jobs that she couldn't do herself. For the most part, Dante's life didn't change. The person who was making moves in this time was Mundus. Enough time had passed since his last defeat against Sparta, he felt now was the right time to try and invade the human world once more. With the Temenna Gru no longer operable, he figured he might have better chances opening a gate on Malay Island. What makes this island so special is that yeah. it is the closest physical location to the underworld in the human <laughs> domain. Once established as a citadel, the occupants quickly experienced the strange happenings that the island possessed. Time flowing differently in certain areas, crops growing out of season, and terrifying nightmares suffered by those who lived here. Since then, the island has become a derelict of time. Demonic influence has since warped and taken hold of just about everything there. To remain a mystery, the island's location changes every night and appears in unexpected locations. Finding it can be damn near impossible unless you already know where it's going to be. Part of Mundus's plan was also killing Sparta's remaining descendant, Dante. To save himself the hassle, he wanted to lure him to the island. And to do so, he created oh. power would be her ability to control- Are we, are we back? I noticed the uh, OBS lagging a little bit. Sorry about that. Be good, be good. Right, I think it's good now. It's just, I think it's YouTube because on my side, it's it doesn't say I am dropping frames. Yeah, it's probably on YouTube side right now. Cause yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. Loading again. My internet crash. No, no, not it's not your internet. It's I think it's YouTube. But yeah, let's continue. Action. She was a mirror image of their mother. Trish was her YouTube crashes because of how hot the guys are. Her name. <laughs> Probably. <She possessed> the supernatural <laughs> powers of most demons, like increased strength, speed, agility, and so on. 
but her most iconic power would be her ability to control electricity. It was her job to lure in Dante, Damn. and so she set forth towards his shop to hire him. Trish makes quite a bold first impression, first showcasing really? of who he is, but more importantly, his vengeance. No one up until this point had ever really been aware of Dante's personal goal. She reveals herself to be a demon and gets into a small little scuffle to make sure he really is the son of Sparta. Dante proves himself more than capable, but just before he goes to shoot her, she actually reveals that she needs his help. As planned due to her resemblance to his mother, Dante accepts her request. Oh. She guides him. <laughs> oh my god. An actual jump scare, holy shit. <laughs> I can't believe I jumped. She guides oh him my to Malay God. Island as thanks to Mundus, she's aware of its location. To be frank, a lot of Dante's journey around the island is hardly worthy of <sighs> note. Only three of Mundus's generals inhabit it and attempt to stop him. Phantom, a giant molten arachnid, Griffin, a large raptor-like bird, and most importantly, Nello Angelo. Virgil at this point has no free will of his own and acts according to Mundus's commands. He challenges Dante several times throughout his journey, but he wouldn't recognize that this was actually his brother. During their first bout, Nello Angelo gets the upper hand, but just when he's about to finish him off, Dante's amulet slips into his view which awakens the memories from his past. It causes him immense pain and he flees the scene. Their second encounter resulted in Dante simply winning and Nello Angelo forced to retreat. But on their third and final encounter, he unleashed his full power for which Dante gives him a little respect, but still not recognizing him. Despite this, Dante yet again defeats Nello Angelo for the into a trap where he is forced to face- God damn, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we are back. Yes, god damn it. It's YouTube's fault this time because I swear to God, I swear it's not my fault because <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, because if it's my internet, it's gonna be it's, it's gonna say I'm gonna I'm dropping frames. Yeah, fine now. Okay, let's continue. His full power for which Dante gives him a little respect. I but swear to God, YouTube, yeah. Him. Despite this, Dante yet again defeats Nello Angelo for the last time. His corpse rises into the air as he screams in pain and disappears back to the demon world. He drops his half of the amulet which Dante picks up and finally realizes that that was Virgil all along. Mm -hmm, yeah. With both halves of the amulet restored and Sparta's blade in hand, his sword is restored to its true form. Seeing all of That's a sick sword, slain, by the way. Mundus has Trish lure Dante into a trap where he is forced to face a demon referred to as Nightmare. It is a biological weapon, an amalgamation of varying demonic material with the potential to consume Ew. all of the demon realm. It has the ability to pull you into an evil dimension where you must face reflections of trauma that rest in your subconscious. Dante is successfully lured in, and Trish reveals herself to be on the side of Mundus. Regardless, the monster is still defeated, and in the aftermath of the chaos, the room begins to collapse. Seeing Trish about to get crushed, Dante rushes to her rescue and saves her life. It God was an damn. that both oh. confused and moved her all the same. Oh. Not being able to help but wonder why he would do something like this, he tells her about his mom and their physical resemblance. But being betrayed in this manner hurt him in ways he'd never been used to, and lashes out at her with heated passion and love towards his mother. You may look like my mother, but you're nowhere close to her. You have no soul. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire. Despite Dante's words, Trish was deeply moved by his actions and actually won her over. Similarly, Dante uh, is wasn't it, as is hostile it time? as he appeared. Is it time? Part of him still cared for her based on how she looked. Mundus I mean... utilizes this to his advantage and uses Trish as a hostage. Upon confronting Mundus, Dante would yet again choose to value Trish's life. What, a, what the hell is this? The result. Though in a surprise change of heart, just as Mundus was about to deliver his final blow, Trish pushes Dante out of oh. the way, taking the attack herself. The sight of Trish's sacrifice only reminds him of the death of his mother, how powerless he was back then, all of the grief, sorrow, and anger, all thanks to this one demon. 
But this kind of round things are different. He's learned so much in his time as a demon hunter. He's had to experience so many different hardships. All of his emotions are channeled into one immense power that only could have come from the blood of Sparta. Mundus pulls him into a new dimension, gloating about how powerful he is and it's, how he um, can do anything. Like domain expansion. <laughs> for Dante as he wanted, similarly to how he made Trish. But with a powerful belt of silence, Dante transforms into the form of Sparta. Let's the go. The commences both from sky and on the Ooh. ground, with Dante, of course, emerging victorious. Even in yeah, victory, of course, yeah. the feeling is bittersweet. The loss of Trish makes him feel guilty for not trying to fill her dark soul with light. In memoriam, he leaves her both with his mother's amulet as well as his father's sword. But as Dante goes to leave the island, he is yet again interrupted by Mundus, who was not killed and has since shed his idealistic and angelic figure for the grotesque demon he always was. No longer in the demon world, Dante's powers are much more limited, though in a surprise revival, Trish shows up, lending Dante her power, where the two are able to push Mundus away and seal him once more. Trish's return isn't greatly expanded upon. It's uncertain if she was only gravely injured by Mundus' initial blast, or if she was killed and brought back to life. I call plot that armor. Killed, That's plot armor. And sword that Dante gave I mean, her, it's it fine. <laughs> to resuscitate her. Anyway, the reunion of the two is chalk-filled with emotion, so much so that Trish even cries. A sign to Dante that a devil has gained parts of humanity. These tears... Tears are a gift only humans have. And with that, the two escape on a plane as the entire oh, island is yeah, right? on itself. That's explode. my question. In the aftermath of the event, Trish then begins working at Dante's business. For our friendship and <laughs> mother love. Devil never cry. Devil ne oh, devil never cry, I see. Trish and Dante would work together for a few years, both getting accustomed. Get it? Devil, devil cried. Cry. Begins working at Dante's business, which he newly renamed Devil Never Cry. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I might be slow at times, but. Trish and Dante would work together for a few years, both getting accustomed to each other's day-to-day -day habits, or more accurately, getting fed up with them largely on the side of Trish with Dante's excessive consumption of pizza for every meal. But regardless of their dynamic, the so he really two likes develop pizza. a very meaningful relationship That's with one another. Cute. Not one of romance, but as described by the creator of the franchise, something much more. We aren't spent much time mm, with them witnessing so the job they don't they love took, but probably the most each other romantically. The two took on in their time as partners was from Dante's old broker, Enzo. You see, despite this working guy. with him for so long, Enzo had never come to bear witness or even believe in demons in the first place. He and Trish became acquainted with each other in their time, same goes for Morrison as well, and so he came to them for a job to explore some ancient ruins that were under construction. Being a bit of a weasel that he is, he was looking to find some treasures amongst the rubble and he needed capable lookouts. As it would turn out, he did find what he was looking for. Dante and Trish were attacked by demons, and Enzo found a devil arm. He initially manages to convince the two to keep it, but upon further research by Trish, she uncovers it was a gun created by Machiavelli, one of the underworld's greatest gunsmiths. He had created many notable weapons, the Artemis, the Pandora, and even the Angelo's armor. When they learned this, they immediately sought out Enzo, only to find him trying to sell the gun. The demonic force within the firearm then possessed Enzo's hand, seeking to take over its host and claim its freedom. To save his life, Dante severed his arm and destroyed the gun. Enzo would survive, and it came to really open his eyes, and he came to fully believe in the existence of demons. The whole thing gave him a change of heart. He wanted to contribute and help out in his own way, and so he opened a Devil Arms pawn shop where he would house all of the various weapons Dante had collected throughout his journey. Oh, collected. that makes sense. This also made Trish realize how she could help out elsewhere as well. Considering her vast knowledge of the demon world and the weapons crafted there, she thought she could help prevent instances like what Enzo went through on her own. And so she decided to leave Devil Never Cry to pursue her own path. She also asked Dante to revert his business name back to Devil May Cry, which he did. Yeah. And with that, after a few years of partnership, Dante... Tess? Hello, Tess? Hello, Tess? Yeah.
Hello, Tess. Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, I swear to God. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Okay, sorry about that. I rewind it a little bit. So, let's continue. I'll reset my router just to be safe. Uh, you don't have to, but yeah, sure. Okay, let's continue on. Years of we still have... Wow. An hour left. Jesus. Dante was back to his own solo gigs, and we reached the events of Devil May Cry, the animated series. I kind of want to watch this now. Anime gives us more of an insight into Dante's it's like a slice of life. Jobs, the lesser demons he's hired to take care of to keep his bills paid. As such, Morrison would get some on-screen time, and we get to witness firsthand what he does for Dante as his broker. A lot of the series actually isn't too important to the larger overall timeline. He does things like stop a demon who kills via racing, competing in a life or death game of poker, and even connecting two lovebirds in a Romeo and Juliet situation. If what? Romeo was a demon. Episodes like that expand on the concept of demons even further and their ability to feel human emotions like his father and Trish did. There are a few mm. episodes that span the series that are definitely worthy of note. In episode 8, Once Upon a Time, Dante is tracked down by his old childhood friend Ernest and brought back to Morris Island. Ever since the day he was run out of town, Ernest was adamant in proving Dante's He looks so good in this style. Responsible for the attack. Holy moly. His method of doing so was by summoning the demon and killing it with a shotgun. By this point, it should be obvious that that plan wasn't going to work in the slightest. Yep. Because of his idiocy, Dante is forced to fight the demon. The fucking, aftermath of everything serious, be man. very pleasant. Ernest learns that the reason the demon came to the town in the first place was because of Dante. He blames him for everything. Sure, blame control, everything on the guy. Him and the others he was close to, not a single shred of sympathy is thrown towards him, and he never wants to see him again. Dante, of course, leaves feeling sorrowful about the situation, as they were once it's Fucking friends. asshole. But while Dante's past friendships may have become lost, new ones are formed. Perhaps Bruh, I know, right? With him specifically, Jesus Christ, some people. his friends become friends. By that, I'm referring to late. Hello, Tess. Yeah, we're back. Oh, fucking hell. I think it's the issue is with um YouTube and OBS. Cause it, it's fine now, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, because I I'm not dropping frames. It's not Oh god damn it. Okay, but it's fine. Seems only at this time of night that this happens, though. So yeah, the let's very continue. First time the two meet, and it's not exactly a friendly first impression. You see, Trish had been working in an area that had become infested with demons ever since a new priest arrived. She'd been going around killing all of the lesser ones, which certainly put him on the back foot. He didn't want to risk getting killed himself, so he actually got a bit creative. By pretending to be an innocent and humble priest whose town was under attack by a ruthless demon, he hired Lady to kill Trish. It was a ruse she outright fell for because Trish is a demon at the end of the day. The two would clash on multiple occasions, going all out with extreme vigor and animosity, largely on the side of Lady. They even have a bit of a spat at a clothing store, but don't fight because there are in fact innocent people around. But in truth, <laughs> the whole situation was made complicated thanks to Trish. Two hot the girls. She was God damn. were fairly weak and she hadn't been tested by a worthy opponent in quite a while. Upon seeing Lady, she seemed like the type who could really give her a run for her money and so decided to keep fighting her. Dante was generous enough to keep it a secret Holy for shit, a little that's Dante? while until it seemed like things might go too far. Everything gets revealed at the church, putting Lady in a not-so-great mood for having been played the entire time. They confront the priest, and he has the oh-so-unfortunate fate of facing the wrath of all Trish, Lady, and Dante together. Mm, yeah, get wrecked, the buddy. Hitting it off. They've come to form a mutual respect for each other in their fighting ability, fashion sense, and pleasure in messing with Dante. But in terms of the larger plot, that comes in the form of a nine-year-old orphan girl named Patty Lowell. 
In the first episode of the series, Dante is hired to protect her as she was supposedly the heiress of a large family fortune she didn't know that she had. The reason she needs protecting is because there are apparently demons who will kill for just money. Dante protects Patty against all of those attacking, but by the end of the episode we learn that she was just used as a decoy. Another woman by the name of Patty Lowell found a girl who had the exact same name, and so pinned all of the media and attention onto her so she could safely arrive undisturbed. Dante Asshole. kills the demon seeking the money, and feeling remorseful for putting a young child in danger, the older Patty offers to raise her. Patty would decline this offer, instead choosing to stay with Dante at his office. The older Patty does still try yeah, to yeah. Make go with Dante instead. The girl a healthy sum of the fortune, which she used to spend on clothes and donating the rest to the orphanage she grew up in. Throughout the series, Patty would be a constant character, always providing color commentary against Dante. However, the truth is, she would have a lot more relevance than initially met the eye. She was actually hey. a descendant of a powerful alchemist and sorcerer named Alan Lowell. Alan used to have the ability to summon demons and bend them to his will. They were obedient and did whatever he commanded. But one demon was much too powerful and could not be controlled. He was known as Abigail, and while not quite Abigail. as strong as a demon king, he had power that could rival it. Seeing how dangerous the power was, Alan created a nigh impenetrable barrier and sealed it away. A pendant known as Alan's Tear was left behind and was the key to gaining Abigail's sealed power. As such, it was highly sought after by many demons. Fortunately, the pendant had the power to ward off many lesser demons protecting its wearer. Mm. The amulet was passed down through the generations and eventually made its way to Patty's biological mother, Nina Lowell. She feared for her daughter's safety and so chose to put her up for adoption when she was still a baby so she didn't have to live in constant danger. The villain throughout the series is a lesser demon named Sid, hoping to claim the powers of oh my God, Sid. himself. Oh my god, Sid. A lesser demon named Sid. Oh my god, it's Sid. <laughs> oh my god. What are you doing here? Sid, hoping to claim I'm just the kidding. Powers of for himself. <laughs> A lot of the events in the anime and jobs Dante goes on are manipulated by Sid as to break Abigail's seal, he needs a variety of items for a ritual. So things like Dante going back yeah, to yeah. the island, <laughs> killing two That's apprentices funny. Don't of Don't tell him though. and so on are all part of his plan. The specifics about what the ritual needs and why specific items are needed aren't exactly specified, so it comes off as a bunch of random things. When he begins nearing all of the items required, he eventually makes his play at stealing Alan's tear from Nina Lowell. He kills and possesses her close friend Simon and convinces her to hand the amulet over to Dante for safekeeping. This the only guy is. I can imagine he did this was because he's he so cool. Another powerful demon dead to use for the ritual. He does make an attempt at pickpocketing the amulet, however, is stopped due to its ward. Not feeling comfortable not being in possession of it, Nina intends on taking the amulet back, but before she can, Sid kidnaps her as the amulet is now the last item he needs. Considering that her mother has appeared out of nowhere and Patty being confident that it's her, becomes a key player as well mm. as seeking the truth about who this woman is. Knowing that she was supposed to come by and reclaim her amulet, Patty instead takes it herself, hoping to deliver it to her so she can see her. When she arrives, what she is greeted with is Sid holding her mother hostage. In exchange for not killing her, Patty trades Alan's tear and Sid uses it to break the seal and obtain Abigail's power. Mm -hmm. With it, he traps Dante in the demon world in a comatose-like state while wreaking havoc on the human one. The likes of Trish, really? and Morrison all try their best to fend off the ensuing demons, while Patty uses the amulet to travel to the demon world itself. While a dangerous She's brave. for the eight-year-old girl, her desperate cries and pleas for Dante's help She's eight? To what? Him. He is awoken from his stupor and lays waste to the demons running rampant nearby. But the real problem is Sid. Like many demons who manage to attain such immense power, he is given a false sense of unstoppable force. It makes it all the more intimidating to them when Dante simply walks right through it. He proclaims, as he has and would many times, that the reason he has power is due to his soul. Sid sacrificed everything that is Jesus. <laughs> his soul for the sake of it's power. <laughs> Sid is defeated, and having gone too far to simply forgive, Dante puts a bullet through his head. And jackpot.
Ah, oh, that's a shame. Virgil isn't here. In the here. end, the world-ending demon was vanquished and things returned to their natural place. Now reunited and not having to fear the threat of being hunted, Patty decides to move out. Patty. Alright, are we back? I hope we are. I'm just wait for a second. Yeah. Yeah, we're back. Okay. Oh, Dante's Jesus. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny to me. Then they got hanged on a cross like Jesus in the previous scene. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's continue. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, uh, Patty was really, uh, she's a really cute kid. But now Trish and Lady are much better friends, and they share in the enjoyment of busting Dante's balls. I don't know why this keeps happening. Dante's next big adventure would come in the form of a book. In The Devil May Cry 2 light novel, we are introduced to a new character named Beryl. A woman with Beryl. red curly hair, black bodysuit, and armed with a heavy-duty anti-tank rifle. As <laughs> they, oh my god. Her story introduces a whole plethora of new lore. Her story goes when she was a young girl, her father tried to harness a demonic item known Balls. as yep. the Beast Heads. <laughs> That's it was funny. a demon created by Mundus which can take the form of either a statue or an actual demon. It can show that who touches it, the past, present, and future, along with a lot of other quirks. That's... While it bears a striking resemblance to Cerberus, which Dante That's has broken. in the past, it's not actually related. Beryl's father tried to use this item in hopes to bring his wife back from the dead. However, the power is much too dangerous for the likes of humans as they're often driven insane upon contact. It instead transformed him into a demon. As such, he tried flying away with his daughter but was shot down. In the process, he also stabbed her with the statue around her collar and neck. Her wound eventually healed, but she gained the ability to sense the presence of the beast heads. Wow. When close, her scar begins burning, like a game of hot and cold. Since then, she's become a devil hunter seeking to one day put an end to the beast heads. The novel consists of her hiring Dante for his help and the two tracking it down. A lot of the story isn't too worthy of note. The journey is made especially difficult thanks to an underworld crime syndicate run by a man named Chen who was interested in using the item. When the two actually encounter and fight Badass, these yeah. heads, it sucks them both into an alternate reality where things get a bit silly and away from history. In this, this new dimension exists a world where Mundus had captured Dante when he was still a child. Virgil, on the other hand, still as the existence of Nello Angelo, led a resistance against him with his lieutenants. Can't believe Fanta. Virgil was. Without any of his original allies, you know. Mundus instead had an army of Trishes at his command. Huh? In this new reality, Dante agrees to help fight against Mundus once more, which he succeeds in, and the two escape the alternate reality. That's weird. The book ends with Chen absorbing the beast heads for more power, so he can fight against Dante, but as per usual, the Devil Hunter emerges victorious, with Beryl putting one right between his eyes. Mm -hmm. The Beast Heads are destroyed, oh. and as thanks for helping oh. her, Beryl gives Dante her weapon. After this job, it's unknown what became of her. Months would pass, and Dante presumes she just returned to a civilian life, since her father was avenged and she no longer has her guy. Gun. But no one really knows for sure. She is hinted at much further down the timeline, however, the woman shown bears almost no resemblance to the barrel depicted in the novel. Yeah. The book ends months later when Dante, pondering about these events and his lack of jobs recently, all of a sudden gets a dagger thrown through his window bearing an invitation to a museum. And this leads to the beginning of Devil May Cry 2. Dante, oh. in both the novel and the second game, so, would now okay. be 33. The plot of Devil May Cry 2 revolves around Argasax. If you recall, he was the demon who challenged Mundus for control of the demon world long ago. And so, the Devil May Cry 2 is like... Two. Sparta yeah, defeated okay. both of them, sealing them away. For Argasax, he used four sacred relics referred to as the Arcana. Or no, Devil May Cry 3 is like a prequel. Eclipse, a gate to the kinda. demon world will open, and Argasax freed. 
Considering that took place centuries ago, a group who was there to witness and even summon Sparta for his assistance against him was formed to safeguard the island of V. de Marly. This group were known as the Protectors. In modern day, an evil businessman named Arius is seeking to become an all-powerful wow, immortal. That guy like Arkham, he too has is like with the dark arts and the epitome of evilness. <laughs> he managed to get away with it thanks to being hidden in plain sight. He runs a multi-million dollar corporation known as Ouroboros, known for its mining and construction. In reality, he used his business to buy up land which housed ancient ruins and pillage whatever he could relating to demons and the underworld. He even used his knowledge of arcane sciences to create artificial demons which he refers to as secretaries. One secretary, labeled Kai, was a defect. Kai. Before she could be disposed of, one of the protectors of okay. Vita Marley, Matie, found her and raised her as a daughter. Kai would be renamed Lucia oh my God, that's so weird. to become a protector herself, unaware of what she truly was. When Arius began to come to can the museum, be a feminine to put it nicely, name. nearly all of the events that happened according to aren't too relevant or yeah, worthy of note. According to Dante sources. meets Matie and accepts her job. Throughout the game, he fights against demons. Lucia learns that she's an artificial demon and has an existential crisis, and the four arcanas are collected to summon Argusax. Arius absorbs some power which mutates him, however, he's killed by Lucia. Dante travels to the demon world and puts an end to Argusax. Despite the claim that he would be trapped in the demon world if he went there, as would later be described by Dante, a portal opened up randomly, cause that's prone to happening, and he just walked through allowing him to return to the human world. Lucia would come to terms with what she is, and the story ends with her and Dante reuniting. Unlike the others Dante's had a history with, Lucia simply returns back to Vida Marly to continue being a protector alongside Matie. Devil May Cry 4 introduces a lot of new characters and story considering that Dante no longer becomes the main character. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? This is on Nero, his life and where he grew up. As vaguely That's so sweet. Thanks guys. Timeline, Fortuna is a city which worships Sparta as a god. You know who's cuter though? It's you guys. You guys are so cute. As he Anyways, <laughs> here long ago, it was home to the largest and most important Hellgate connected to the demon world. As such, oh. he used the Yamato to seal it away and prevent it from ever being used again, lest someone use the sword to reopen the seal. Long after Sparta disappeared, they formed a religious organization dubbed the Order of the Sword in his name, where they swore to eradicate all demons, fighting for the lives of mankind as he did so long ago. They are led by Sanctus, a former general mm. of the Holy Knights and a devout follower of Sparta. He was so these um dream of these groups the always have an agenda that he even killed I just know the it. former Pope Solemnus. About 17 years prior to modern day, he was I don't trust them Pope. one bit. However, his dream of inheriting that title was unlikely as it is only passed on via the current Pope's death. To avoid any suspicion, he spent the next two years of his life slowly poisoning Solemnus until he inevitably passed away. No one suspected anything and Sanctus inherited the title. In fact, his timing of receiving the title would actually coincide with another visitor who came to Fortuna around this time, Virgil, more powerful one day, and who will they worship then? Sanctus would remember this conversation and piece together himself that the man he just met must have been a descendant of Sparta. Anyway, with Sanctus in charge, the Order of the Sword's ambitions oh, and so methods became old be much bearded. more extreme thanks to a scientist named <laughs> Adams. In the, church, yeah. <laughs> the man grew up in Fortuna and thus came to hold strong what the, hell? the beliefs of those who live here have been accustomed to. However, he He's moved huge. away Holy at some shit. point and began working at Ouroboros, Arius's company, where he met a woman working there named Alyssa Martin. She is That's a useless so... character who doesn't hold too much significance, but she is the half-sister of Rock Goldstein, Nell Goldstein's son, who I like muscular women. The company. Somehow she and Agnes wound up falling for each other, and they had a child whom they would name Nicoletta. However, when she was around two to three years old, Agnes got a summons from the Pope and immediately made his way back to Fortuna alone. 
Even though Alyssa was willing to move there with him and even adopt the religion, she soon became diagnosed with an incurable disease where she was hospitalized. Don't and judge me, man. Oh my god. <laughs> Rock Goldstein would then adopt Nico and raise her, teaching her all about her family's histories, most notably Nell's work. Agnes's contributions to the order were practically invaluable. He and Sanctus were key to shaping its entire structure for a new era. The anti-demon weapons the Knights Dawn were designed by Agnes and feature a combustion engine for powerful strikes. He made various artificial demons by magically crossbreeding weapons with animals. His most common creations were the Alto and Bianco Angelos. They are armor inhabited by the soul of either a human or, more often than not, demon and act according to its master. Yo, to get the wait. souls of demons, Those armors also are created cool as hell. artificial hell gates. By copying the real one and powering them via devil arms, he could allow a small quantity of demons to pass through, which he would then capture and experiment on. It was also mm, he who invented clever. the savior, a giant statue-like demon created in the image of Sparta. By melding together millennia of demonic matter and spirit, it attained such immense power, but to control it, it needs to absorb someone with Sparta's blood. And they also need his iconic sword. The savior was meant to be their weapon to wipe out all of the demons. But one of Agnes's greatest discoveries was the Ascension Ceremony. It was a magical ritual which he developed where members could imbue themselves with demonic power. Only those who were strong enough in both- Isn't that ironic? Magical ritual which he developed where members could imbue themselves with demonic power. So in order to fight demons, you have to be using demonic power. Isn't the, isn't oh my god. Yeah. Imbue themselves with demonic power. Only those who were strong enough in both mind and body were able to survive the process and attain a newer demonic form. Those who fail wind up losing Fight fire with fire and turn into unnatural that makes sense. false demons. And finally, also procured was Virgil's shattered Yamato. After his defeat at the hands of Mundus, the oh. blade somehow made its way back to the human somehow. Blade, and the order was able to obtain it. With it, they would be able to reopen the Why didn't they explain and that? kill all demons who come through. Agnes worked diligently to try and make it whole again, but could never quite figure out how. Yeah. Now we can finally get <laughs> just, the light <laughs> character. Just tape it down. <laughs> just use duct tape or something. <laughs> Nero. Being the, the church really do be having some wild guesses from the Bible. Unexpected child between the relations of Virgil during his visit and who many assume was a prostitute at the time. Upon his birth, Nero was left at the doorstep of the city's orphanage. Oh, it's Nero? It's Nero. Oh, that makes sense. Holy shit. So Nero is um uh, Virgil's offspring. God damn, alright. Daughter or son? Is Nero a wait. Nero's a guy, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, holy shit. All right, yeah, that makes sense now. Nero by the workers there because of the black blanket he was wrapped in. Growing up, his childhood wasn't very pleasant. He was often bullied and made fun of by the other kids for having a prostitute for a mother. Considering that the town is relatively small and everyone knew everyone, when someone was expecting a baby, people knew. Since no one gave birth to him, everyone assumed that he was a bastard child. Yeah, but not everything that's... was doom and gloom for poor Nero. There were those in Fortuna who had Stop judging. Holy soul. shit. Two siblings often visited the orphanage to help out, Kyrie and Credo. They were faithful followers of their religion and believed in helping those in need, just like Sparta did in the past. She kind of cute, they though. They became particularly close to Nero thanks to their parents, who took a unique liking to him because of his rare white hair. It reminded them of their god, unbeknownst to them, and so he became close to their family. While a slightly biased way to start off their relationship, 
It in no way had nefarious intentions. They treated him like family, always praying for and believing in him. Nero would even describe them as the kindest people he ever knew. Unfortunately, they later died at the hands of demons uh. who failed the ascension ritual. Crato was aware of this fact, as he had standing within the order, however refused to tell Kyrie for obvious reasons. Nero, while he was never very religious to begin with, completely stopped believing in God after this event. He figured that if he truly existed, he wouldn't have let such kind people who cared for him die. Fortunately, he did still have Crato and Kyrie to lean on. In fact, Crato would serve as much of his mentor figure. He admired not only his kindness like the rest of his family, but his honor, sense of justice, and his combat prowess. It was he who taught Nero how to wield a blade, and in fact, he's the reason Nero decided to join the order despite being an atheist. I have a he question, though. Um, since, uh, since Dante and Virgil are half, half demons, does that mean they're immortal? Does that mean they age like humans are? Or like humans do? I was just curious, because, you know. Was inspired to follow in his they history. are? They age? Or are they immortal? Sorry about the delay. They age but not die naturally. Oh, I see. Yeah, thanks for the info. As well as play a part in protecting the city that That's so interesting. So much. Nero as I thought they would had a at least become Nero. immortal. His lone wolf mentality meant he wasn't very good at teamwork and he was looked down upon for his use of guns. The Since you know Virgil got stabbed as a kid and Dante got a bullet by Lady. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh, as you might expect, had a rocky relationship with the Order. His lone wolf mentality meant he wasn't very good at teamwork and he was looked down upon for his use of guns. The Order believed in using a blade, just like Sparta. Nero also heavily modified his weapons because he felt like he was restricted and they weren't powerful <laughs> enough to take down You know what they weapons. say? In a sword fight, always use a, always use a gun. <laughs> but possibly one of the most important days that changed Nero's life was the day his arm changed. On a completely normal and unsuspecting evening, everyone was going about their lives as they normally would. Kyrie was taking the kids at the orphanage for a field trip through the forest when they were suddenly attacked by demons. Three knights were sent to help out, but Nero rushed there of his own volition. One of the knights died trying to protect everyone, and Nero made a desperate entrance and pleaded for Kyrie to run. Kyrie, run! God damn, the voice acting. A multitude of different factors contributed to Nero partially activating his Devil Bringer, his deep rooted desire to protect Kyrie, along with sustaining an injury to his arm while fighting against the demons. Whatever it was, something within him triggered. His arm slowly Devil. began to change. Devil trigger. He initially believed it was some sort of infection from the demon, and so bandaged it up to keep it hidden. But over time, he slowly realized by himself that whatever it was had power against demons. So he began to train it in secrecy. He became proficient in its use and utilized it to its fullest. Considering its demon-like appearance, no one was aware of Nero's arm as he feared the repercussion and reaction those might have. Unlike Dante and Virgil, who have a devil trigger which encompasses their entire body, Nero's is referred to as a devil bringer, oh. as it is officially part of him. Another ah, I see. Is, needless to say, amongst their history, that makes and so Nero much sense. <laughs> Holy shit! For each other, and eventually became a couple. Okay. Fast forward in time a bit, and we change perspective oh. entirely, all the way back to Lady. Fast forward in time a bit, and we change. Oh, that's huh. Interesting. Let me just uh, let me just take some screenshots. 
Okay, we good. Perspectives entirely all the way back for um Not research purposes, still of course. Jobs hunting demons, but during one of them, she encountered an Angelo, which took her prey. <laughs> one time was annoying, but it happened several more times after, and she didn't have a good feeling about them. She was able to tell that they were. De yep, that's me. It's been a long time since it lagged, so. Yeah, we good, we good, we're back. I think we're back. Okay, moving on. Holy shit, YouTube, please. Please, let me just finish this. Please, I beg of you. A demon would be collecting other demons as well it's as fine now. Thanks. devil arms. <laughs> she turned to an acquaintance of hers who's a purveyor of artifacts where she drew the order symbol which she saw on the armor, and he told her about Fortuna City. Much to her bewilderment, she learned all about their religion and worshipping of Sparta. Seeing multiple red flags, she decided to tell a now 38 year This is so frustrating. <laughs> Alright, is it good again? Sorry about that. I don't know what to say, because our internet is really fast. It doesn't really lag that much. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's continue. 38 years old, Dan. Don't they still wear the same clothes the guy never bathed? <laughs> I would imagine he smells really nice though. You gotta admit. Multiple red flags, she decided to tell a now 38 year old Dante about it. It didn't seem like it was because she didn't think she could handle it, but perhaps he might find it interesting to learn more about his old man. The whole situation was very fascinating for everyone involved. Trish was the first that person to set skirt forth and arrive shot, in the city, though. <laughs> as it seemed like she was very interested in learning about these people. The role she played was more of reconnaissance. Yes, there were many red flags picked up by Lady, however, if the people were harmlessly worshipping Sparta, then there was no real need to do anything about them. But like any chain of command, all of the really shady details come from the top. So it, how long is it? A way to oh, an executive within the Holy Knights halfway come a part of that inside circle quickly. Fortunately, she just so happened to possess one of the most important pieces. I think we're not going to finish this whole video because Sparta's blade. Uh, I think this video has. Yeah, this video has some uh, parts with Devil May Cry 5, so I will not be watching that i think let's see so unrecognized she completely changed her entire appearance to a dark-skinned white-haired woman with an overtly overtly sexual outfit you don't say or to control the savior sparta's blade to go unrecognized <laughs> she completely <clears throat> changed her entire appearance hmm <clears throat> <clears throat> To a dark skin, interesting skinned white haired woman with an overtly sexual outfit. She went under the alias Gloria. Upon handing over the Sparta, she was rewarded with an executive position, which came much to the chagrin of the others. Her rapid promotion made it so they barely. Oh my god, her holy alone shit! If she could be trusted, and her clothing <sighs> wasn't exactly very holy. Oh. <laughs> Please stop. Oh my god. Walking on thin ice around everyone. <laughs> YouTube was in a position to receive Please. Oh god. Information is <laughs> really all she cared about. Lady would also be I swear to god this stream is going to get demonetized. I've never seen or detailed. I just thought it would be important to note that she is also in Fortuna. Dante's arrival would be a bit more delayed than Trish's as she had to accrue all of this information and relay it to him. But eventually, he came to learn all about the Hell Gates, the Ascension Ritual, the Savior, everything. And so, Dante made the decision that the Order had to be stopped. Yeah. Alright. On one unsuspecting morning day, a sermon was being... The Dev knows the what they're doing? Yeah. Is. They sure do. Performing. And in fact, it was an important day for her and Nero, as he intended on giving her a... Damn it. Holy shit. YouTube. Oh my god, please. Uh please let me go. Please. Uh. He was interested in seeing. 
He sticks around just long enough until Kyrie arrives and can claim her gift, continuing to be the cool and doesn't care type. Thanks for outside. sticking around, Drew. I really appreciate it. Also, Lizzie Cat. Thank you, thank you. Through the ceiling and Sorry about the lag. Ah, uh, oh my god. A panic spreads throughout the church as Dante continues to battle against the demonic guards. Being the supreme general of the Holy Knights, Kratos is understandably concerned about his vicar. But that also made him a target for Dante's blade. Kyrie makes a mad dash to protect him, breaking away from Nero's grasp, only to collide with some bystanders landing completely vulnerable on the floor. When Dante approaches her, unlikely that he was actually going to do anything, Nero immediately steps in. Furious uh. that he was put in any sort of danger, he decides to fight Dante himself. He proves to be more than meets the eye, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe in combat, but it'd be more accurate to say Dante's just playing with his food. What does surprise him is his demonic arm. Unlike the typical devils that make up the portion of the knights, Nero's bears a striking <laughs> resemblance to a devil trigger. That's and funny. On top of that, <laughs> the look in his eye while fighting reminds him of his brother. He leaves him with an ominous message saying how they're the same, though it's a claim that even he's not so sure about. Dante then heads off to take care of the rest of the order. So, uh, Nero Dante is go about his plan at Dante's his nephew. As he instead opts to take is it? his time and have a look around the city to learn more about the history of his father. But with Dante Maybe. now in town, it meant the order could proceed with their plans. They always wanted him to come to the city eventually, as they needed blood from a kin of Sparta to power the savior. It's partially why he probably already knows about it in hopes to lure him in. Nero is one of the very few within the Knights who is unaware of this, leaving him very confused over his relevance. Nevertheless, Kratos commands the capture of Dante, which Nero promises he'll do. Demons then break out across the city, wreaking havoc. After ensuring the safety of Kyrie, Nero proceeds on his journey to where Dante was last seen headed. On his path, Nero encounters many of the demons guarding their respective Hellgates. He even crosses paths with Trish, disguised as Gloria. Best girl. Course. It's their first Best official girl. time meeting, so Holy it's not shit. an all too eventful interaction, both largely eyeing and sizing up what the other is about before parting ways. Behind the scenes, things are going surprisingly well for the Order as Sanctus returns to life. Through the ascension what? ceremony, he was able to be resuscitated from Dante's assassination, but with new demonic How the vigor. fuck? Kratos fills him in that he has his men, as well as Nero, hunting Dante, which comes much to the chagrin of Agnes. As previously established, Nero doesn't have a very positive reputation amongst the Order due to his rebellious nature. It's only because of the history he and Kratos share that he's been assigned such an important role. Agnes's worries about him were not without warrant. He feared that he might stumble upon his hidden research facility where his more shady tests are performed, and that's exactly what happened. Nero throughout his journey has become incredibly untrustworthy of the Order, seeing them as demons encountering the Hellgates, even getting attacked by the Angelos. Everything had hinted that something very nefarious was going on, and finding Agnes's lab was the coup de grace. It was the same lab where the broken Yamato was being held, and he has a run-in with Agnes. Here, pretty much all of the Order's plans get revealed to Nero in a grand Oh my god, the way she holds- As typically goes for villains who do this, Agnes is fully <laughs> expecting Nero to die by the end of this so he can perform tests and study his mysterious arm. Thus is the reason he shoved his sword through his chest. In a very it's gotta be painful, sense, man. despite his demon blood, Nero was dying. His life flashed before his eyes, the important moments throughout it, and Kyrie. It was all becoming lost to him. But within his fading, he was reminded He's of beginning to believe he'd been having more and more frequently. The power of friendship. Him, there was a man he'd never met before, staring at him with a cold glare that had an odd touch of gentleness. He asked Nero if he could hear it, the cry of a soul. He added by asking what his dying soul was crying for right now. Nero didn't respond to his question, instead relaying it back to him. The man responded, with power. I want more power. Hearing that, Nero replied, he'll take that too. The Yamato close to him was resonating with his soul, the blood of Sparta, the blood oh, of the I see. wielded this sword before him. 
Nero used his Devil Bringer, restoring the Yamato to its natural form. The power was so intense that Dante felt the surge of energy from elsewhere in Fortuna that it for a brief moment caused him to Devil Trigger. According to him, it's only a reaction that can be caused by someone of the same blood origin. And to add on to that, it felt extremely similar to Virgil's. But Dante knew his brother was no longer around, let alone in the human world, so he became extremely conscious of Nero. Similarly to Virgil, Nero had an God damn, that's, lust that looks so power, cool. But unlike him, it wasn't a desire for himself. It was so he could protect those important to him. It was perhaps that which made the difference into not turning out like his father. Agnus was forced to retreat, leaving a now very upset Nero in his wake. Pissed off beyond belief, Nero figured he'd turn to one of the few people he actually trusted for answers, Crato. But before he did, Agnes returned to the council, flustered and up in arms about Nero, even accusing Crato of being aware all this time that he was part demon, a fact that he certainly did not know. Sanctus would keep a cool head about the situation. Crato would be ordered to arrest the Nero. Yeah, the yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. To capture Dante in his stead. But in reality, Trish had realized her time undercover was drawing near, and it was time to cut the deception. But probably the most important shit, revelation stop. Sanctus would have is Nero's bloodline. Chill. Hearing about his demonic arm, Bruh. as well as the fact that he restored the Yamato, he figured Nero must be the child of that mysterious man he met 19 years ago. The timeline certainly added up, and so figured he must have impregnated a woman back then, and Nero was his offspring. This completely changed everything. They no longer need Dante to power the savior if they can get their hands on Nero. And unfortunately for him, Agnus overheard his cries for Kyrie. The confrontation with Crato would be filled with mixed emotions. The two have obviously formed a bond over the so tempted by that lady. But Nero has begun to You have no idea. <laughs> and Crato has always had the utmost faith in them. Pair that with just learning about Nero's demon arm and witnessing Kratos' willingness to have turned himself into a demon, and you get a battle not fought with logic, rather emotion. The duel ends with Nero emerging victorious. Yeah, However, of course. Seeing his defeat, Agnes brought Kirie to their location to witness their fighting and see with her own two eyes Nero's arm. She is understandably taken aback by everything being thrown at her at once, with near all of it completely out of context. That's, For Kratos, that's not fair. For Kratos, sister like this was crossing the line. He believed in just about everything the Order stood for, but not this. Agnes would abduct Kirie, keeping her as a prisoner to continuously lure in Nero. Kratos would leave to find Asshole. out the truth behind the matter, while Nero was led into yet another trap. Sanctus, while he was positive in his assumption about Nero's bloodline, had to be sure. After a duel with him and Agnes, there was without a doubt that Nero was a descendant. You have indeed inherited power. Kyrie is taken one more time, but this time directly to the savior where Nero is required. On his path there, Nero yet again runs into Dante, who this time was looking for him. He caught word that the Yamato had been restored, and Nero was the man in possession of it, so he came to take it back. With all emotions running high right now, things don't go so simple, instead breaking out into yet another fight. Amongst his heated temper, Nero's Devil Bringer arm activates, and the Yamato with it. This was the exact moment Dante figured out. Holy shit, that's so kid. cool. All of the other coincidental evidence hinted to it, but this was the confirmation. Once the fight is over and Nero has cooled off, Dante makes a bold decision. Seeing Nero's desire for how he intends to use the power, he lets him keep the sword. Then keep it. Now that you're calm and cool, <laughs> get going. Trish would also return to Dante, dropping the guise of Gloria. Nero's confrontation with Sanctus would not go in his favor. Using Kirie as a hostage, ah, he <laughs> subdues Nero and extracts the Yamato from his arm. Kratos returns back into the fray to try and stop Sanctus as revenge for using his sister, however fails and is fatally wounded. Oh. Nero is absorbed into the savior and it is left up to Dante and Trish to clean up what's left behind. In his dying moments, Kratos informed the two about Sanctus's plan to release demons and exterminate them all with the savior. 
before he leaves them with his dying request. Save them. Kirie and Nero. Dice. <laughs> That's sad though. I wish I didn't laugh. <laughs> oh man, I feel I feel like an asshole now. I'll do it. Agnes is given the Yamato, and with it he is able to open the true Hellgate, unleashing havoc upon all of Fortuna. With that, the Order's plans have come to fruition, and it is up to Dante to stop it. As has come to be expected of him, not much, if anything, truly stands in his way. He destroys all three of the artificial Hellgates and the demons guarding them, and he even has Jesus a poetry Christ. slam against Agnes. Despite all of his research and attempts at harnessing the power of demons, he is no match for the legendary Devil Hunter. Uncertain as to what makes Dante so strong, he inquires for the sake of his research. Dante hints that humans have something that demons don't, before putting a bullet through his research paper, and then one through his head. Oh, man. That is so satisfying. That is so cool. Holy shit. With all obstacles Fucking out of his way, Dante <laughs> ventures into the bowels of the facility Jesus Christ. to retrieve the Yamato and close the Hellgate. To make sure it is never used again, he returns to the surface and uses the blade to destroy the Hellgate once and for all. All that was left was to take out the Savior. Problem was, it was fully powered exactly as intended. By using Nero, a blood of Sparta, as its battery for a lack of a better term, the exterior was practically invincible. It could be nicked and scratched, but taking it down that way would cause a whole lot of collateral damage. So he figured the only way he could take it out was from the inside. He pierced the Yamato straight through the Savior's chest and right to Nero. This Ugh. would be the first glimpse we ever witness of the Yamato's special trait. The sword has the ability to separate human from demon. Nero was literally melting away inside of the Savior. He was living inside that black void. But the sword allowed him to break free of that and re-enter the human world. With sword now in hand and responsibility placed on his shoulders, he went off to confront Sanctus once and for all. Oh, Similarly, inside? I Agnes, see. Sanctus's worshipping of Sparta hails from a misguided sense of power. Instead of trying to emulate the type of person he was, they were trying to emulate the strength he possessed. And it is because Nero embodies Sparta's best qualities that he is able to defeat Sanctus and rescue Kyrie. Nice. The threat would not cease. The Savior then assimilates Sanctus and begins using him as its battery, oh. becoming the False Savior. It's nowhere nearly as strong as it once was and is exceptionally slower and clumsier, making it easy work for Nero to destroy so no one else can ever use it again. With that, Fortuna's adventures end. Kyrie is saved and Dante gets to yeah, say goodbye to his bot. newly discovered nephew. While That's Nero a yikes. was initially worried about Kyrie's reaction to his demonic arm, she completely accepts everything about him, just the way he is. Kyrie. If I'm a demon, and not a human anymore, is this what you want? Nero, you're you, and it's you I want to be with. I don't know anyone who is as human as you are. I want your D, Nero. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> is this what you want? Nero, you're you, and it's you I want to be with. I don't know anyone who is as human I am as ruining you. everything. Wait, that's Kyrie. Yeah, that's Kyrie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew. <laughs> no 
Looks like they're determined to interrupt. Come on, man. Of Devil May God Cry damn. In the past, nice. Nero and Kirie had damn, motherfucker. <laughs> MF interrupted it. Yeah. They all got blue balled in the end. Jesus Christ. She said she was gonna wait. You know she wants that. You know she wants it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh my god. I'm so, I'm so awful. <laughs> With the events of Devil May Cry 4 in the past, Nero and Kirie had a no kiss scene for you. Yeah, yeah I think I deserve it. <laughs> but their lives wouldn't change much. With Fortuna having suffered massive damage to its city, Kirie busies herself with helping those who've lost their homes and prepares food for them via a soup kitchen. With the nature of who she is and what she does, she didn't make any money nor accept it when those offered. She was usually paid in food or other essential items. That led to the monetary side of living up to Nero. Fortunately, having met Dante, he's learned that demon hunting can be a business. So he and Kirie opened up their own Devil May Cry branch in Fortuna. Dante was even generous enough to donate a blue oh, it's the van with the business's name. And on top of everything they're already doing, I I, I know that van from Max Source video. Julio, Kyle, Holy and shit. Carlo. The orphanage where oh. they grew up was destroyed, so they took them in and take care of them. The incident also attracted many reporters and novelists investigating the city. Nero had convinced everyone to keep quiet about what happened as it was quite ridiculous of a story. As yeah. such, he was the only one who spoke to them, but the only thing he told them is how there was nothing interesting there and to leave. It was reported on in the Occult Times magazine by an author named Jeffrey Turner. He wrote about the savior's attack on the city, the order of the sword, everything he was able to research without actually being there, which he surprisingly got a lot right. He was very passionate about the article, however, it was so outlandish and unbelievable to the general public, it left a serious stain on his journalistic integrity. Since then, he's considered it nothing but a failed article, but still believes wholly in what he wrote. All of the events just detailed, as well as about to be, take place within a time frame of five years, most in the latter half. In the prequel novel Devil May Cry 5 Before the Nightmare, we follow a whole plethora of differing perspectives and paths that all wind up conjoining to one location. One of the character's perspectives we follow is that of Nicoletta Goldstein. Oh to recap, my god, another hot character. He left to rejoin Let's the order, go. Left behind his sick wife, who died of an incurable disease. Since then, Nico's completely hated him and was adopted by Rock Goldstein, her uncle, and was raised with an interest in engineering and gun making. In fact, it was inadvertently Dante who inspired her. You see, all of this time he's been wielding his iconic pistols with a misspelling on them. Nell engraved them with 45 art warts. Mm, yeah, 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 I remember. spelled it when he was a kid. Since time has passed and her son Rock has grown up trying to honor his mother, Dante came to his shop one day with Ebony and Ivory asking that he fix the mistake. It only seemed right that since he was the reason it was wrong to begin with, he should be the person to correct it. Rock would have no idea who Dante was or why he had the pistols, but he was able to deduce the type of character he was based on the wear and tear of the weapons, which he also recognized as his mother's work. The weapon spelling would be fixed and Rock would take a picture to commemorate Nell's masterpiece. It was that picture Nico found which completely sent her head over heels. The craftsmanship, design, material, she was so infatuated with everything she so naturally fell into the field of engineering and gun making. Rock taught her everything that he could. She became good, but nowhere near as good as she wanted. Uh, she yes. even decided to stop making pistols as she knew she could never surpass the work of Nell. So, to further her experience, she turned to an unlikely source, Agnes. She did not like him, had no warm feelings for him whatsoever, but she couldn't deny his genius. 
he gave up literally everything in favor of research. God damn. The problem was Nico had been reading articles about Fortuna and they detailed the disappearance of the order. Despite running the entire city, after the incident, they disappeared into thin air. She didn't know if this was true, however. Any information she was getting was from occult magazines and they had a tendency to lie just to spice stories up. So she arranged a meeting with the author of the article, Jeffrey Turner, to speak with him face to face. He more or less confirms everything we already know about the incident while at the same time not really knowing anything. But he does tell her about the one person who was willing to speak who claimed to be a knight in the order, Nero. With that, Nico set forth oh, to Fortuna with only hello. a name to guide her. By pure trial and error, asking every single person if they were or knew someone named Nero, she came across Julio, the orphan he was taking care of. While good parenting on their end, teaching him not to speak to strangers, he found her specific asking for him by name curious, so he led her to their home where Nero is working on fixing his weapons. While he initially believes it may be Gloria based on the dark skin description, he instead is met with a complete stranger. An immediate red flag, as strangers aren't supposed to know what went on, so it understandably puts him on edge. The two mix about as well as oil and water. Nero hates her incessant smoking and rude attitude, and Nico <laughs> hates that he lectures her like a Hello, Tess. We back? Yes, we are back. Holy shit. Uh, let me just finish this up until this part. It's fine now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so <laughs> You have no idea how much I appreciate that, man. Thanks. Okay, let's continue on. Regardless, she immediately cuts to brass tacks and asks that he help her find the Order's research documents lost in the mayhem. While he can see that she doesn't seem to have any ill intent, the fact that he doesn't really know her and not knowing what she wants them for is too much of a risk, and so denies her request. It's not until she drops a completely out of the blue question that really grabs his attention. And that's what happened to Agnes. He immediately answers, saying that he's dead, to which Nico simply scoffs. When asked how she knew him, she informs him that he was her father. Despite dropping that heavy statement, Nico yet again completely changes topics on a dime and shifts her attention to Nero's Red Queen, which he can't quite seem to get fixed. Being completely obsessive and nerdy over this stuff, she almost immediately identifies what's wrong with it and fixes it for him better than it ever was. Being the good guy he is, Nero now feels indebted to her and so agrees to help her find her father's research. The two venture into Fortuna Castle, where Agnes is old. It's a guy. It's a dude. I thought it was a woman. <laughs> what the hell? So this guy. This. Yeah, that. This was located in guy is. Much everything. Yeah. <laughs> Nero was still uncertain about her at this time and intended on shooting her if she showed any signs of using the documents for malicious intent. But the opportunity never presented itself. Instead, the topic of guns Jesus did get Christ. brought up, and she even inspected Blue Rose. She began speaking all about Nell's work and her handiwork, which Nero had very little interest in. That is, until she brought up Ebony and Ivory. He immediately made the connection between her and Dante. Because of his connection to him, it makes him feel like he's in an awkward position. He completely stands by Dante and what he did as he's an important person to him, and Agnus was a terrible human being who kidnapped Kyrie. But at the same time, it's still her dad. Nero explains this whole situation to Nico, and she doesn't care at all. She still doesn't like her father. But that doesn't seem to change Nero's conscience. From this point on, their relationship would shift to friendship. Still a rocky friendship where they're fed up with each other, but <laughs> a friendship nonetheless. Nero yeah. and Kirie would allow Nico to stay at their home as she studied Agnes's research. To earn her keep, Nico decided to become business partners with Nero and make weapons for his Devil May Cry branch. For now, let's put their story on hold as the events to come snowball into a much larger series of events. Yeah, we still haven't uh, met as V of a detour to the main narrative, yet, Dante would pay so I'm really curious about his character. Once more. 
Ten years after defeating Argusax, he is once again requested by Matsue to help out with a new demon named Balrog. Balrog served as Argusax's right-hand man and has all of a sudden appeared on the island, but Matye doesn't believe Lucia can take him all by herself. The pair are once again reunited and fight their way to the powerful demon. Even despite all these years and Lucia training to become stronger, Dante is still Dante and is more than capable of handling a situation like this alone. He sees that Balrog possesses a shard of the broken Yamato as not every piece was collected by the Order, which is likely how he entered the human world to begin with. To counter his fiery flames of hell, he uses his trust yeah, that's Cerberus to shatter yeah. the Yamato fragment, but it results in Cerberus breaking as well. The battle comes to an abrupt end when Balrog realizes who Dante is and he stands no chance against him. He willingly turns into a devil arm, hoping to one day be strong enough for a rematch. Just like that, Dante seems to have suddenly re-entered Lucia's life, only to leave it just as quickly. She realizes <laughs> that she has romantic guy. feelings for him, but as Dante does, he offers to come back if more demons should appear, giving the idea that he's oblivious to the feelings others have for him. And with that, he leaves the island that and That screams main character energy shop. so much. Returning to the life of Nero, about one year has passed since Nico came to Fortuna and has been living with them. Considering their circumstance financially, devils have been appearing less and less in Fortuna. So he and Kirie thought that it might be a wise idea to take their demon hunting business mobile. If he could travel out of oh. town, it would expand his job reach yep. exponentially, meaning that they could better provide for their family. It was and know this van. So this van is very notorious. They began working on fixing up an old van so they could get to work. But on one unsuspecting evening, something completely unexpected would occur. And that was the reappearance of Virgil. Yeah, I saw this on Maxar's video. Don't get used to it. Nico, I showed you those order docs. So you still owe me, remember? Hey, you two. Dinner's ready. YouTube, right you do. Hey, why don't you go ahead? I'm gonna finish up here. <sighs> I'll try to save you some. Not. Not. Wow, her voice is unique. Where's the music? Where is it? You a demon. Nero, the food's getting cold! Trinian, get back inside now! <laughs> Holy shit. I'm taking this back. Is he dying or something? Holy shit. was left bleeding profusely on the garage floor as Kirie and Nico That's intense, holy shit. figure teleport away. An ambulance was immediately called and for the next few weeks, Nero would remain in a coma. Virgil had returned to the human world. It'd been over 20 years since he last lost yeah. Mundus and had been tortured and controlled under his influence. But as time had passed, he eventually managed to free himself from both him and the demon world. But it did not come without a cost. His body was weak, crumbling before his very eyes. He was struggling to hold on to his own life, let alone power. If he ever wanted to defeat Dante and attain the strength that he so desired, he needed to get rid of what he thought made him weak, his humanity. While he was strong enough to rip the Yamato from the arm of Nero, afterwards he returned to his family home in Redgrave City, where everything began. Using the power of the Yamato and its ability to separate man from demon, 
he plunged his sword through his chest, forcing two halves of the same man to be created. One was the purely demonic half of Virgil's soul, the embodiment mm. of his lust for power, I see. completely and utterly heartless and cruel. The other reminds me of Elden. <gasps> disdained human half. As perceived, he was very weak, even by human standards. What the f That's... That's V? That's how he... Holy shit. Holy shit. My mind is just... God damn. Okay. That is so interesting. The embodiment of his lust for power. Holy shit. I guess the other guy is called Urgil. <laughs> Why you gotta do him like that, man? Stained human half. As perceived, he was very weak, even by human standards. But these two weren't the only thing purged from Virgil's body. Also pushed out were four physical manifestations of the trauma he endured when he was Nello Angelo. They each mm. took the form of Mundus's minions during that time. Griffin, Shadow, Nightmare, and Phantom. As the trauma and humanity were holding him back, they were purged from his body. Feeling completely powerless in the midst of such demonic power, he didn't want to die. After finding his childhood book of poems on the floor, it reminded him of his happier past. Sensing his desire to live, the most intelligent of the nightmares, Griffin, swooped in and saved his life, dragging him outside. This half of Virgil would adopt the name V. Are we back? Yes, I think so. Okay, let's continue. Just a few more, just a few more minutes. Holy shit. Oh, poetry would be his most defining human characteristic. As such, it is at the forefront of his personality as he recites it often. Considering how pushed down this side of him used to be, V is much more in touch with his emotions and introspective over his past self and actions. He's able to understand what went wrong for Virgil, especially in his outlook towards humans. V respects them and believes their tenacity to never give up is their best quality. He's a calm and quiet individual, but still very pragmatic due to the fragility of his existence. And most importantly, mm, he's retained all of the information of the past, unlike his demon half. The two are not without their similarities, however. Oh, that's... Oh, I see. Their desire for power. However, yeah, I get it. is a bit more nuanced. Without his demonic power, he's a fading entity. A fact that he's fully aware of. He wants to rejoin his other half and stay alive, all to become whole once more. But it's obvious that he wants no part of who V is. The only way he uh. can become whole once more is to defeat his other half and forcefully take it, something that alone he cannot accomplish. Speaking of his other half, it should be that important makes sense, to though. detail his plans. As he would later be nicknamed Yurizen, his plan for power was by consuming the Clyphot fruit, the same fruit Mundus used to conquer the demon. Persona plot. <laughs> I haven't played Persona, so that a new one could be but I really want to try it. in possession of the Yamato, he slices open a hole to the demon world, allowing the tree to grow into the human world. Due to its suspicious nature, the people of Redgrave City uh. only monitor the strange anomaly until the tree became ready to nourish itself with human blood. For the time being, Yurizen claimed the empty throne in the demon world and simply waited for the tree to grow. Mm, Upon I being see. saved by Griffin after his birth, he explains to V that he too is a dying entity. The four familiars expelled from Virgil require a host to continue living. So he figured since V lacks the strength to defeat his other half himself, that by forming a contract with him, they'll work together lest they risk dying. While initially unswayed by Griffin's pitch, the bird is forced to prove himself. After stealing the clothes off of a punk who was robbing an old man, uh. Griffin showcases his combat prowess by subduing an impusa. Considering Yurizen's newfound birth and power, demons are beginning to appear more and more, putting Redgrave City in grave danger. Much to the shock of both Griffin and V, the Impusa that he attacked wasn't killed, 
While the two bicker and Griffin attempts to take it down once more, he runs out of demonic power, leaving V to fend for himself. He reflects on his weakness and how frustrating it is to sit on the sidelines, and so instead decides to fight. He breaks into an old antique shop nearby and steals a cane. While Griffin respawns and distracts the demon, V stabs it, dealing a killing blow. While the two are initially baffled, he uses a cane, right? We learn that since Griffin and the others are simply nightmares, they lack the ability to actually kill anything. Like a dream, they can cause damage, but they'll never outright kill you. For that reason, V must be the one who delivers the final blow. As for his cane, it's actually nothing special. It was theorized that it was crafted by accident with small amounts of demonic material. Like him, the cane is also very weak in demonic power. It helps work as a conduit to assist in killing demons. After this incident, V formed a contract with Griffin and attached to him via tattoos. Despite the oh, allegiance, I see. they were still very weak collectively, so Griffin urged him to seek out the other three nightmares and forge packs. They can join willingly like he just did, but V is also able to force a pact if need be. During this conversation, they are attacked by Shadow. He steals V's cane, sensing its demonic power, thinking it can somehow get back to the demon world with it. It runs off, and the pair give chase. But when they follow it into an alley, they see it's been attacked and is on the verge of death. Oh. The culprit was Phantom, the third nightmare. He is excessively hostile and has no intentions of serving someone as weak as V. As such, he goes on the offense, trying to kill them all. Now the two are forced to think of a strategy on the fly. They can't deal with both Phantom and Shadow attacking them, so Griffin suggests just forcing a pact with Shadow right here and now. V doesn't get time to think about it as Shadow recovers and is pretty pissed. In a moment completely devoid of all logic, V drops his defenses entirely to plead with Shadow if he wants to obediently die or struggle to live. If it's the latter, then he needs him. The message gets through to him, and the three decide to team up and fight Phantom. They expose his core and destroy him. While outright killing Phantom comes much to the chagrin of Griffin as he feels his powers were needed, V says how he wouldn't have cooperated anyway. Mm, At the very least, yeah, they makes did sense. gain a new ally. But lacking a true powerhouse within the group, V asked if there were any other nightmares still around, to which Griffin sheepishly said, There's one more, right? One, the nightmare. Based on the abomination engineered by Mundus, V was advised to steer clear of this monstrosity, but he was determined that he would need its power to rival Urizen. They made their way to an old church where it was located, and it quickly gave V's confidence a reality check. After almost instantaneously one-shotting both Griffin and Shadow, it absorbed him into a nightmare. It showed him and tortured him with everything. Mundus, Trish, Nello, Angelo, and even Dante killing him. V was forced to experience and live through all of this again. But he felt insulted by these illusions, like they were trying to say that he would never be as good as Dante. He used his anger and channeled his demonic energy, forcing his way straight through to the core of Nightmare, crumbling it beneath his feet. He still did not force Nightmare to become an ally, nor did he waver when it retaliated and impaled him. What he did was take its core and bestow it upon him. He takes ownership of Nightmare as they, in fact, always belong to him. The message mm. resonated with the monster, and it formed a contract, giving V his three familiars. After commanding all three of them at the same time to I wipe see. out the ensuing demons, it took a toll on his body and caused him to collapse. While the demons were all taken care of, V was forced to reflect on the limitations of his powers. While he believed Nightmare was powerful enough to perhaps defeat Yorizen, his inability to sustain him longer than a few seconds renders everything pointless. And considering there are no more familiars to form contracts with, it meant V was at a dead end. After reflecting further on his life and the reasons Virgil lost to his brother, it sparked the idea to simply recruit Dante, as he was the most surefire solution of defeating Urizen. It was important to V that he remained as anonymous as possible, meaning he didn't want to accidentally raise any red flags that might draw suspicion towards him. 
This meant going through the correct channels. While he was fully aware Yep, we're back. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> I'm really sorry, guys. Alright, it's just, it should be just a few minutes left. 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Yep, let's continue. Aware of where Dante's shop was located, most jobs <laughs> come through Morrison, so to blend in with the crowd, it was important to find the broker. But before that, a little detour does ensue. You can't hire someone it's weird, a job without any money. If the I'm disconnecting, the then it should it stutter. You know what I mean? Robbers. The first time he does so, he's witness to a woman being robbed by three thugs. When they demand she hand over her necklace, she begs to keep it as it's a memento of her mother. This reminds him of when Eva gave him her half of the amulet, prompting him to help out, but crash landing into some trash. The robbers obviously turned their attention towards him as well, but he had nothing to give them despite their demands. After being assaulted by one of them, Shadow gets pissed and skewers all three of them, though non-lethally. From here, he <laughs> sure. gets their money and leaves the woman's necklace behind, stating it holds no value. While the woman would be traumatized by what she just witnessed, it showcases V's moral compass and the fact that he does have one. And this would be how they accrued their revenue. After going on wild goose chases trying to track down Morrison but failing to find him time and time again, V was badgered by many thieves along the way due to his fragile appearance. But eventually one of their leads was to Gru's cellar. Formerly <laughs> Gru's known back. as Bobby's cellar, it was the dive bar that Dante and the other mercenaries Holy frequented shit. when he was still going under the name Tony Redgrave. Yeah. If you recall, Gru was Dante's old partner mm -hmm. who was killed. Since then, his remaining daughters took a Ah. Yes, that's me. <laughs> okay, continuing on. Father Morrison and a woman named Sally had been watching over the girls, and after 10 years, Morrison decided to visit the bar for the first time. We get a little bit of banter showing how Dante is still not a very large yeah. figure around there. I think I'm just gonna tragedy. record my experience with this game, probably. He's been sending money over the years. It is then when V walks in and finally finds Morrison. Dropping a bloody stack of cash and explaining the gist of the situation and the severity of it, Morrison agrees to introduce V to Dante. He's led to the Devil May Cry, and as he waits outside for his introduction, Griffin brings up a few things. Firstly is whether or not Dante might recognize him. V's not too concerned as he physically bears no resemblance, but he was encouraged to act differently from Virgil, suggesting that he break the ice by telling a joke. The other is what he would do if Dante couldn't win, an idea that never crossed his mind. It did force him to think about Nero for a split second who, when last he saw him, was lying on the floor bleeding out, though he thought he was too weak and Dante was still the safer bet. And with that, Morrison made his way into the shop to speak about his new job opportunity. Also, it's Patty's 18th birthday coming up since it's been 10 years since the anime. Oh, Just yeah. I'd bring that up as it's relevant to the scene. You could have at least knocked, Morrison. Yeah, I could have. God damn. That voice, I got though. Some good news and some bad news. Pick your poison. Which you want to hear first? <sighs> Just speak. Bad news it is. Lady Patty's feathers are all ruffled. See, she wants to invite you to her birthday party, but your phone is disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> You're a smart one, Morrison. You notice the electric and water out too? I expected nothing less. <laughs> so what's the good news? Oh, I got a gig. Cash up front. Cash up front? This I like. The water needs turning on, and those toilets need flushing. They sure do. Water, gas, and power. Coming out of your cut. You're a real agency now. Wow. 
Yeah, I saw this scene. <laughs> oh, come on. I'll take you up on that gig, but only if you can get me out of that hellish birthday party. <laughs> Consider your RSVP declined. Meet your new client. It's gonna Listen, be the, yeah. I'm gonna find a lady in Trish. Bring him in on this. What? Come on. You don't think I can handle this gig on my own? It's a big job. Big job, Dante. You're gonna need the help. God damn this so, man. What's your name? He's handsome as fuck. Holy shit. I have no name. I am but two days old. Just kidding. You can call me V. Okay, V. Why don't you tell me everything about this job? A powerful demon is about to resurrect, and we need your help, Dante. <laughs> now that's a familiar tune. Do you have any idea how many times I've heard that exact same line? This is special. Special? Okay. So what's so special about this one? This demon is your reason. Your reason for fighting. This demon got a name? Virgil. Yep. V utters the name of his brother, Virgil. It shocked Dante into a stunned silence, but it quickly turned into a furious rage as his demonic aura overwhelmed the room. Part of him thought V was toying with him and making the whole thing up, but after he brings up how it doesn't matter if he believes him or not, <laughs> no, not that V, Ryu. Demonized. Come on. To pay attention to the news, that gives weight to his words. Dante chooses to believe him, and V is delighted by his intense reactions. To prevent the others from finding out about Virgil, V insists on using an alias. This is where Urizen would get his nickname. As he said he would, Morrison set off to find both Trish and Lady. Both of them express their beliefs that Dante can handle the job alone, but are convinced to help out for separate reasons. Trish decides to join out of spite after Morrison said Dante didn't need her help, and Lady is fascinated about his connection to Redgrave City as she recalls seeing Redgrave engraved on his guns. And with that, Morrison escorted V, Dante, Trish, and Lady via helicopter to the Clifot Tree to defeat Urizen. Upon taking mere steps into the Clifot, V realized he completely underestimated his power. He felt Urizen's aura course throughout his entire body. It was vastly more powerful than when they initially <laughs> separated. Just a touch made it feel like his heart was being erased, leaving him to feel like he definitely needed an insurance policy. This is far worse than I thought. There's no crime in turning tail, V. They yeah, this is actually from the game You're itself. Right. It's probably a good idea if I don't watch this part. One must always have an insurance policy. <laughs> Who was that guy? I can't believe he just ran. No one special? Come on. Let's go. <laughs> no one special. Jesus. <laughs> First come, first serve on the targets, right? Music to my ears. Hurry up, Dante. Gotta Guess say, I though. To see it with my own. Dante looks. Uh, what? <laughs> Dante looks real good. He looks so nice. All right. I think that's about it for now, because I don't want to ruin my whole experience with Devil May Cry 5, because uh, I think I've got enough of a gist of this whole uh whole section of the video so yeah i'm gonna stop here for now so yeah the uh streaming problem
yeah, it's really hard. I don't know what to say, cause wait, let me just uh, you know, let me just put on some jazz music for you guys. Yeah. It's hard because, you know, I know I'm not the one who's at fault here. Because I am not, I'm, I wasn't even dropping frames, you guys. I. Jeez. Nice intermission page. You like it? How much you bought the MC5 though? I think I bought it for... Wait. I think I bought it for less than $20. Right? Less than $10 actually. I bought the uh... see see it's I know it's not my fault I <laughs> what the hell Jesus Christ okay uh going back yeah I think I bought it for less than actually less less than ten dollars so pretty it's a pretty cheap buy I gotta say and I and I got the one with um, with Virgil on it so that's really really nice I always wanted to play as Virgil but yeah I'm probably gonna I'm I'm not gonna stream Devil May Cry even though I really I really want to stream that game yeah, unfortunately, I'm just gonna stick to uh, the good old Let's Plays. Yeah, if you're, if you're interested to see my uh, gameplay, just stick around, you know. I might upload, I might upload every now and then. <laughs> but I'm not busy with rehearsals and stuff. Because internet is crap. Probably, I don't know. Uh, Cause we recently got our internet upgraded. So I don't know what the problem is actually. Maybe you can stream, you can stream it in Discord and upload a VOD after. Hmm. I'm, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, as I was saying, I I don't know if I can upload daily. Maybe it's the OBS problem. See, that's the thing. <laughs> I don't know. Because on my screen, it doesn't say that I'm dropping frames necessarily. It just randomly disconnects for some goddamn unknown reason. And when I'm, you know, when I'm, when the stream is up, I I am not losing frames at all. So, yeah, it's probably, uh, it's probably OBS or YouTube or maybe, maybe just maybe my internet. God damn, I love this, love this song though. It's so chill. But yeah, I'm sorry for ab abruptly um, ending the video because I think I think I got most of the stuff down because we we were kind of delving into uh, the Devil May Cry 
what the hell did I just say? Devil May Cry 5 storyline. <laughs> so yeah. Actually, you know, uh, earlier, I said that I was going to be late because I was on band rehearsals. We were rehearsing for this, um, there's this huge festival in the Philippines where you, uh, how do I explain this? <laughs> there, so basically there's this huge, these huge lanterns and there's people controlling the lanterns and they have to we are gonna be rehearsing for sorry about that it disconnected again let me just repeat what <laughs> what i just said uh so basically there's these huge lanterns and people are um kind of they have they have a soundtrack that they follow and they kind of choreograph the lights so that it matches the soundtrack and so us us you know the ensemble we have to rehearse for one piece that is six minutes long it it has to be six minutes long not more not less and so we were we were rehearsing for that and we kind of finished early so <laughs> yeah that's why i was able to stream a bit earlier than usual but yeah about the streaming the whole streaming situation i don't i just don't know man i'm probably gonna try another platform probably on twitch because i really i uh, even i won't watch this stream because of the lag god damn also thank you guys for sticking with yeah i think it's probably yeah it's probably my internet that's a yikes i don't know okay thank you for uh watching this super scuffed stream uh <laughs> i don't know what to say honestly i think it's my internet because it wouldn't happen consistently right if it was youtube it was a fun stream yeah thanks <laughs> I think I'm probably gonna stream on uh, another platform, mainly just Twitch. Let just to see if it can, the internet can handle things a bit better on Twitch. So yeah, thanks for coming, uh, Lazy Cat and Ryu. Does it happen before similarly? Um, on last stream, I think it happened. Yeah last uh i think it was on sunday sunday stream i did a test stream and it was horrible it was way worse than this one because i i adjusted some settings on this particular stream seems a lot better but i don't know it just keeps on disconnecting for some reason which is weird it's weird because the connection is stable when the stream is live it doesn't fluctuate like you know you know what i mean so yeah try to use something better than obs maybe streamlabs or something probably i mean i'll i'll try but i probably won't be i probably won't be uh streaming they will make cry on awful you know <laughs> on an awful connection should i say got the next i got disconnected a lot too yeah i would imagine let's change the music a little bit by the way what are what are your plans for christmas guys guys got any dates any you know oh 
forgot. I hope Jin's holiday went super well. My my imagination about that, you know, that swimsuit is just my imagination is running wild. Nope, <laughs> stay lazy. Nah, come on. I I mean I hope at least you have some sort of plans this Christmas. You know what I mean? Sussy imagination. <laughs> yeah. I just. Why did she have to say that she, she's wearing a swimsuit? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Okay, maybe I'll try to draw to draw first. Hashtag Dojen illustration. I'd be down to see that, honestly. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe as Christmas present, but I think she's gonna choke me. <laughs> I think she will. I think she's genu genuinely gonna choke you. She tries to flirt with you. Wink. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about flirting though. I think she she genuinely wants to strangle us. <laughs> yeah, I think she will fuck me. <laughs> You know what? Yeah, I think she will. <laughs> God damn. But you you know, she's unique in that way, that in that sense that she wants to kill her viewers, so yeah. Ah well, yeah. Just go prepare for your demise, man. Just brace yourself, <laughs> I guess. Hmm. Okay. Oh, what the fuck? Sorry. Oh my god, it's 12.21 a.m. Jesus Christ. She can strangle me, I'm a cat. I have nine lives and I'm small. <laughs> Apparently she can. <laughs> yeah, man. Hmm. Okay, since it's getting late... I'm gonna go probably I'm probably gonna try to stream another time maybe when uh, when Jin is not uh, sorry <laughs> I'm getting the three hour three hour mark you know dumbness in me <laughs> so yeah I'm probably gonna stream when uh, when Jin is not streaming so yeah, see if uh, see if I can stream on Twitch probably. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a DM. Do you on Discord for uh, for your Twitch? You know, if you see if you have a Twitch account, and we'll see if I can make you as a mod there as well. Good night then, I'll go play some Minecraft though, bad internet is killing me. Ah, oh, that sucks. I mean, yeah, bad internet gang. Represent. Let's go. Okay, I'm gonna go now. So thank you for sticking with me till the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. I'll see you around. Okay, goodbye.